and we are um, in collaboration with aims rishikesh will be deliberating upon this important issue so before this um, uh, i would first like to invite our chief guest professor dk singh and the executive director and ceo of aims bhatinda to kindly address the gathering um dr dk good afternoon to all of you thank you dr madhur so on behalf of aims bhatinda and myself also i welcome professor surega kishor the director of aims gorakhpur professor arun agrawal professor umesh kapil from ilbs professor sunila garg dr harvan stopla ji dr rachita gupta and all other faculty member uh, from other institution from aims bhatinda i congratulate first i congratulate the department of community medicine for organizing this important discussion group important uh, on imp very important topic i think uh, i don't have the correct data but uh, what i have observed i will pass it to you for the discussion i you are all means uh, expert people and uh, you should address the problem i have been told that uh, the 5% of our children is suffering from childhood obesity to my mind this is the side effect of development side effect of the economic growth i don't have any data that uh, what was there in 50s 40s and what is there in 90s or in 2000 the percentage of uh, this problem childhood obesity if you take as a special group of the doctors both parent working doctor what i have observed their children are having this uh, problem more i don't have the any data but uh, through the any like gathering i i see i find that the children of the both parent doctors are suffering more maybe because of uh, the time constant the ch parents are not getting time um, uh, even covid and before covid the children are going the sports field very less there is no sports activity and even the parents are not getting time they are buying the peas by buying the children's whatever they are, they are demanding junk food is the i think the every child likes junk food every child like junk drinks also so as a parent if they go home and child is crying or demanding for any kind of things they because there is no shortage of money so they are buying for the happiness of the children it is not the happiness of children only but just they are buying the peace with child because they are devoting less time with the children uh, i know also that there is problem of childhood hypertension i think obesity childhood obesity should be looked with childhood hypertension if there is any special group or especially those who are obese they are having more hypertensive problem or not it is for you to collect the data and suggest some measures if they are the two separate uh, problem then this that also should be looked into separately and moreover you all know that during the last two years we probably spent more time on the social media mobile phone laptop tv even the children <coughs> were asked to attend the classes on mobile so every child child has got now a mobile phone a smart mobile phone so we must uh, discuss about the what is relation of uh, overuse of this uh, mobile phone with the children and if they that is causing any problem of the obesity or hypertension so with this uh, i will say that uh, whatever comes in the west we follow but we take the only bad things from the west Uh, we don't promote our local food we don't promote our healthy food and uh, we don't promote we just go and there is a big money in the advertisement there is a big price 
uh, the junk food are being marketed i mean the because of, i think because of the advertisement by celebrity uh, the children are getting fascinated and uh, they are uh, making also the children friendly items and advertisements so we must look and we must recommend what is to be advertised what is not to be advertised in at least in the food category so i think this society is competent enough to recommend the government of india that we should not advertise we should not allow uh, for the advertisement of this junk kind of foods and uh, i should i will not take names like pizza burgers ice creams there are so many things which is bad for the health but uh, they are being advertised on the tv and they are being advertised by the celebrity also so with this i again uh, congratulate the department and hope that some good recommendation will come from this uh, discussion and uh, they will forward their recommendation to government of india um, you all uh, are working in the community and family medicine recently i was there in uh, gujarat to inspect that institute of public health uh, I, i personally say that we need good public health uh, people because when i visited uh, that university I, I, as a chairman of the uc committee it was for uh, giving them the university status but at the same time there was only six or seven faculty and uh, maybe 12 uh, staff uh, oh, sorry class 3 class 4 staff and only 60 students and it was totally underutilized so we did not recommend it uh, the that is should as a university status but at the same time there are many other uh, regions to recommend also because the state government had already approved as a university so we need a good public health recommendation we need a good public health institution we need a good uh, people in the public health because uh, i am sure that we cannot treat our population only thing the preventing if we can prevent the disease that will be the best thing and you all know that prevention is the best method and with this hope i again uh, welcome the all the faculty experts and uh, delegates those who are participating i request them to visit uh, ems batinda sometimes they, so that i can utilize your opinion and uh, other, i can get some recommendation from you with this i in here thank you very much thank you sir uh, now i take this opportunity to uh, first uh, thank our honorable director sir dr dk singh sir and all the senior faculty members uh, uh, from of aims batinda and from at the national level so i can see a lot of uh, senior faculty members from um, community medicine and from other disciplines have also joined us so uh, from aims batinda i would like to welcome all the uh, senior faculty and i would like to thank our director sir who has uh, facilitated us uh, uh, for this workshop and this is the Uh, why we have chosen this uh, on particular day that uh, today is a world obesity day so this is a opportune time where we can sensitize uh, policy makers and uh, uh, our faculty members and young pgs uh, to further act on this important risk factor which is increasing uh, many more uh, non communicable diseases like diabetes hypertension uh, cancer and so this is obesity is a common factor for all these and uh, if you see the past data overweight and obesity is increasing in childhood uh, and adolescence and this is further aggravated during this covid period because of sedentary lifestyle so uh, we have to make extra effort at uh, various medical college through various associations like iapsm ipha if uh, epidemiological foundation of india we are making this effort and uh, we are thankful to the uh, aims rishikesh also for taking this initiative 
and they are doing this uh, today's workshop with us. So thank, uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Pradeep Agrawal. So today we will focus uh, uh, about various obesogenic environments and how front of package labeling is, uh, can help in elevating it to some extent. So uh, details of F FOPL will be shared during this, this presentation and uh, we have uh, uh, with us during this session our uh, president of uh, our association, uh, IAPSM president, present and uh, uh, the next future president will also be joining during the panel discussion. So I want everyone to be with us during these uh, talks, as well as for the panel discussion. So thank you. Uh, thanks to director, sir. And now I will hand over it to Dr. Ramnika for further proceedings. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. For your presentation. Sir has been a motivational force in our various endeavors at Ames Batinda. Thank you, sir, for your constant guidance. Uh, and I believe our department will do further uh, better under your kind guidance. Moving on to the sessions today, I, it is my proud privilege to introduce the chairpersons for the keynote lectures. Our first chairperson is Dr. Surekha Kishore, ma'am. Ma'am is the director and CEO of Ames Gorakhpur. She has a vast experience of 29 years working on various administrative posts and teaching and training of students. She is a mentor, member of National Medical Commission. She is ex-dean academics, Ames Rishikesh. She has also been ex-dean social outreach, Ames Rishikesh. She has presented and published a number of papers in eminent journals and conferences. And she has been a recipient of SEEDFON award by Southeast Asia Diabetes Foundation. I welcome you, ma'am, on this important CME. We have our next chairperson is Professor Dr. Arun Agarwal. He is a very dynamic senior professor from PGI Chandigarh. Sir, with his vast experience, is currently heading the Department of Community Medicine at PGI Chandigarh. He has contributed and organized a number of workshops on MDR and CDR. He is a national trainer for CDR and IMNCI, and he has also validated the WHO verbal autopsy guidelines for stillbirths and neonatal deaths. Sir is a member of NTAGI, founder president of SRS, is the founder chief editor of IJHSIR and the ex managing editor of IJCM. I welcome you, sir, uh, on this CME, and I hand over now the platform to Dr. Soumya Sahu to introduce our lecture series uh, speakers. Thank you, Ramnika, ma'am, for the introduction of our chairperson for this keynote lectures. Uh, Today, um, I have the proud privilege of uh, introducing the resource persons for our keynote lectures. There, there would be a series of four lectures. Uh, the first would be uh, by the, on the role of nutrition in childhood obesity. Uh, it would be taken by Dr. Sai Ram Challa, who is presently working as scientist E in the National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Sairam completed uh, his MP in community medicine from the Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. He has worked on hypertension control among geriatric population in urban slums of Hyderabad and has been involved in the state coverage evaluation of uh, childhood vaccination program by UNICEF. Apart from this, he is currently pursuing research in nutritional interventions through primary health care, social determinants of malnutrition, TB malnutrition, and interplay of malnutrition, infectious disease, and NCDs in the communities. Uh, take, uh, over to you, Dr. Sairam, please. Thank you, Dr. Soumya. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, you're audible. Uh, I'll, I'll try to share the screen. Is the screen visible? Uh, so the screen is visible, but uh, PPT hasn't been opened, I think. Yeah. 
now not yet sir yes sir yeah perfect make it a full view perfect sir perfect go ahead thank you so the topic uh, given to me is uh, childhood obesity the role of nutrition uh, i would like to uh, look at this presentation as a review of uh, the literature that is happening uh, in india and uh, other parts of the world so i'll cover the uh, topic in another uh, 20 minutes uh, we'll see what is the current evidence uh, about pediatric uh, i mean childhood obesity and uh, what are the practices and what are the scopes uh, for research future research then we will uh, focus on uh, something like what uh, where, where are the areas where we can collaborate so when we discuss about uh, childhood obesity these are the things uh, we need to look into uh, the uh, whole concept of uh, childhood obesity will be on the, the background of uh, uh, nutritional transition uh then childhood obesity as uh, dr uh, dk singh sir was mentioning uh the rates are around 5 6% uh, and it's not known to many people that uh it is uh, already evolving the numbers are increasing which we will see now the, the, we have some data so we can see that so it's an evolving epidemic in india whereas it's a pandemic all over the world then uh the important concepts of life course Uh, uh obesity is uh, uh, is something to do with throughout the life uh, it it will it's going to affect the population and it's an inter intergenerational phenomenon then we need to understand the life course in these uh, headings uh, with various stages of childhood then uh, adult obesity then food systems is another major component that plays a vital role in uh, childhood obesity so you all know the definitions but just to quickly reiterate Uh, we call a child uh, below five years is overweight when his uh, weight for height is more than two standard deviations above World Health Organization child uh, growth standards median, and obesity when it's more than three uh, standard deviations weight for height. Between five to nineteen years, we are going to call it uh, as overweight when BMI is more than one standard deviation, and uh, when it's more than two standard deviation, we'll call it as obesity. in adults we have two classifications uh, internationally who classification where uh, overweight is bmi more than or equal to 25 uh, whereas uh, uh, obesity it is more than or equal to 30 uh, kg per meter square uh, then of course we have asian cut off points coming to the uh, phenomenon of nutritional transition as most of you are aware of this uh, this is something which is very important for the uh coming 20 30 years because uh, this is what is anticipated that we will be going through these phases which we have already entered uh, uh this is actually uh, proposed by dr barry popkin uh what is called as nutritional uh, transition model uh, where all societies go uh, through a shift of uh, diets which are high in fruits vegetables and healthy fats to diets that are high in sugar saturated fat and processed meats uh sorry processed foods so if you see this diagram here as you can see uh like demographic transition uh all the societies go through this five stages where uh, initially we will be hunters and gatherers uh with not uh, with no major uh, non communicable disease uh, effect then we'll have a phase of famine and uh, receding famine uh where uh, nutritional deficiencies and uh, uh health deterioration will be uh, conspicuous but still non communicable diseases are not yet seen where introduction of horticulture and uh, agriculture has started then finally we will start seeing the globalization of food system where we'll have uh, uh, the, the uh, all over the globe uh, whatever is being produced will get uh, uh, cultured into other uh, societies and uh, we'll start seeing degenerative diseases this is where we'll be seeing double burden of disease with uh, overweight in mothers underweight children and fetal origins of adult onset diseases then high prevalence of non communicable diseases this is where we are entering now then finally there will be a stage of uh, behavioral change where healthy aging and eating healthy lifestyle modification will set into the societies and uh, uh, stress reduction increased physical activity 
uh, will happen. So at that background, uh, what is the burden of obesity uh, <clears throat> through the life course in Indian scenario, if you want to see the statistics, uh, at NIM, we have uh, had about uh, last 30, 40 years of uh, uh, field work where uh, that has been collected uh, across uh, villages, cities, and uh, uh, tribal populations. Uh, and this, uh, this was there till the year 2015, uh, what we call as National Nutritional Monitoring Bureau. Uh, this data has uh, been one of the sources for uh, uh, so some of the graphs I'm showing you. So we call this as uh, NNMB. The NNMB data shows zero to five years. As you see here, there are uh, uh, bars here, blue bars, they are underweight. Uh, and the three bars represent, the first bar represents urban 2017. These are at three different points. And the data is from uh, across about 10 to 15 uh, states across the uh, country. So first bar you are seeing at 25 uh, is underweight children below uh, the, uh, five years, uh, around 25%. And, but uh, then that's where we are seeing uh, about 4.3% uh, children are uh, the, having uh, overweight. Then coming to rural areas, it is 41% underweight and 1.6% overweight. Then tribal belts, uh, which is uh, 2009, after which we didn't have much data in tribal uh, areas, uh, where underweight is high, but uh, overweight is very low. So uh, this is a very important thing, as you all know, because most of you come from uh, community and family medicine background, these uh, primitive areas or the societies where still the uh, lifestyle disorders are not set in, this, is, this should be one of the focus areas where to prevent further uh, problems. Then uh, another data set we are going to see at uh, CNNS data survey, data survey, that is a, a comprehensive national nutritional survey. Uh, their statistics, this is what it is showing the burden. Of course, uh, we'll see a few slides here. Mm, if you compare various uh, major public health problems related to uh, nutrition and uh, non-communicable diseases, uh, this is a uh, burden of malnutrition among children and adults in India. Uh, this is in millions. Stunting in children in 2016, about 46 million. Diabetes in adults, 72 million. Whereas overweight and obesity is 166 million in adults. And anemia in all ages is 447 million. <clears throat> so definitely overweight and obesity is, a, is going to be a leading uh, uh, issue, not only in childhood uh, and later stages also. This is another uh, data analysis we have done uh, from the CNNS data, where we are seeing children from uh, 5 to 19 years. Here, as you see, we are comparing in the first two groups, male and female, uh, they're almost uh, similar. <clears throat> the uh, blue bar represents five to nine years age group. Uh, that is uh, early school age, then 10 to 14, then 15 to 19. So uh, what is conspicuous as you can all see here is uh, rural, uh, the prevalence of overweight and obesity is not uh, still high. Whereas urban, it has already reached uh, uh, around eight to 10%. Then uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, uh, the Life course, uh, as we discussed, uh, when you look at uh, obesity as a life course epidemiology, uh, what has started, as you can just link with this, this slide, around 8 to 10%, uh, we have seen adolescents around 18, 19 years, they are having overweight and obesity. As you see here, uh, of course, this is first slide I'm showing is overweight in rural Indian adults. Uh, what I want you to uh, look at it here is this is a uh, 10 year uh, age-wise increase in prevalence of uh, overweight and obesity in rural areas. As you see, the dotted lines represent uh, NFHS uh, 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 3, that is 2005, and a decade later, NFHS 4, that is 2015 and 16. I have not put NFHS 5 into this, uh, but you can see they have rates have doubled even in rural areas. The pink one represents obesity among women, and the blue one represents obesity among men in the rural areas. They have almost doubled in these 10 years. The overweight uh, prevalence in urban Indians uh, is, uh, has further furthermore rise, as you see here, uh, uh, women be, being little more than men, around 34% of urban Indian adults, uh, adult women are obese and around 33% men. Then this is obesity as we have defined the previously. Uh, this will be little lower than overweight. 
but they are also doubling up both in uh, rural areas and also the urban areas this is the what nfhs data is showing us this is another uh, uh, graph which is showing us about uh, comparing the uh, again adult nutritional status when you compare chronic energy deficiency and uh, overweight and obesity uh, uh, again nnmb data of uh, 2009 tribal uh, rural and uh, urban so at different time points uh, uh, definitely in urban societies uh, the uh, 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 undernutrition is coming down whereas uh, even in adults the overnutrition is increasing uh, this is again now comparing the uh, malnutrition status including overweight as you see, as you can see here there are three major uh, rows here stunting thinness and uh, overweight uh, what we are comparing here is on the left uh, uh, thing we are seeing india where we have nfhs 3 4 data and cnns data and the right we have uh, who various regions uh, what i would like to appreciate is uh, uh, the stunting and uh, thinness as you see the world regions it's all green and yellow whereas india is still around uh, orange and red whereas overweight as you see uh, uh, this is something like a you can't say really silver lining but then still we have not reached the stage where uh, uh, the uh, right uh, major uh, column what you are seeing the world where it's all so red especially uh, some of the regions uh, where the obesity prevalence in these age groups has, has gone to even uh, the adolescent age group has gone to even 30% in india it is still around 4 to 5 uh, around 7 to 8 in those ranges so we are probably at the stage of uh, the big tide that's going to come up why we are saying that is as we discussed again previously the nutritional transition the same phenomenon has occurred all over the world uh, this is the data from uh, i have given sources for all the slides at the bottom of the slide so the data from uh, us uh, 1963 to 2008 the similar phenomenon has occurred everywhere the uh, uh, obesity rates have picked up at different of different age groups over a period of uh, the two to three decades uh, similar thing happened in uh, uk then uh, the similarly for waist circumference and this is an article from uh, lancet journal where you are seeing uh, all over the world they have compared data from 1975 to 2016 uh, the uh, worldwide trends in body mass index, underweight, overweight, and obesity, uh, which is pooled populations, uh, both what they observed is all over the world, both the uh, adults, the dotted lines, are the is the adult and the uh, non-dotted line is the children and adolescents. Uh, all in all these in both these age groups across the years, uh, all over the societies it has increased. Uh, that is among women and this is among men. Now, uh, the same uh, 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 Lancet publication shows one more important uh, finding here. Uh, as you see here, uh, this is the mean BMI. Uh, India is still around uh, in the lower status, uh, whereas Western societies have gone to a very high uh, BMI states. This is mean BMI on the left side is uh, in girls and right these boys then uh, this is obesity prevalence as it is again we are in the beginning of the pandemic as we discussed uh, beginning of the epidemic in india uh, of the uh, global pandemic of obesity on right side we are seeing boys uh, as compared to the underweight as you see we continue to have uh, both in girls and boys a very high underweight so the same article also shows the uh, shows this uh, demo uh, i mean the nutritional transition you can clearly see here the first two graphs, if you see girls 1975, girls 2016, each line here represents uh, one country and all these countries have uh, shifted. The age standardized mean BMI has increased from uh, uh, 19, uh, 1975 to 2016, both in girls and boys. So the, uh, that said about the uh, burden of uh, uh, overweight and obesity among children and uh, how it uh, goes to uh, adulthood. Uh, coming to the etiology, I, just uh, looking at the uh, onset, uh, there are various uh, 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 research works which have linked uh, obesity with uh, multiple factors, uh, genetics, uh, the epigenetic factors, then food intake, eating behavior, obesity in children, physical activity and inactivity. 
Mm, all a lot of work has uh, been done in West because they have been facing the obesity problem for almost uh, now 20 30 years and where it has already plateaued so we can find lot of literature in the western uh, societies uh, uh, and uh, that should help us in developing models for our uh, 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 states and country one of the models as you see here the multi causational model uh, model of uh, childhood obesity uh, as you see here this is known to most of us but uh, uh, this is something which is very interesting here as you see uh, basically we have inherent risk like uh, genetic uh, predisposition the body composition uh, that's the core of uh, the multi causation model of childhood obesity then we have cultural uh, associ culturally associated factors like body image the diet the physical activity which uh, which form the major uh, cause uh, then we have so uh, socio environmental uh, context like socio economic status physical environment and social stressors now this is what is important for india because this is where uh, we are heading uh, this is the transgenerational effect of this multi causational model where we have uh, uh, the mothers who have for the first generations going into uh, the maternal inherent risks the first uh, picture you are seeing here is the maternal factors and the child factors in the lower uh, pie chart cylindrical pie charts so as you see the first one uh, the maternal inherent uh, risk uh, then the maternal maternal culturally associated behaviors and uh, maternal socio environmental context all this uh, prenatal programming as a product of maternal risk factors will affect the offspring inherent risks which is more than higher than the parental programming the offspring's culturally associated behavior the new cultures as uh, one of our uh, um, uh, uh, respected professors were mentioning the doctors uh, kids having more of obesity uh, and the pandemic uh, precipitating obesity all these are uh, uh, the new generation phenomena uh, which will uh, add up to the maternal uh, risk factors then the components of dietary energy intake and ener energy expenditure that may impact the development of overweight and obesity in adults if you see this is the major uh, balance which is uh, which we all know uh, we the energy intake energy dense food consumption as against the physical activity uh, uh, both things are happening the physical activity is coming down daily routine is coming down so schools are uh, more reached through vehicles or uh, the leisure activity uh, the uh, the uh, screen times tv they are they have been uh, affecting the uh, obesity generation and at the same time consumption of uh, fat sugar uh, soft drinks fast foods uh, portion size energy density glycemic index snacks all these so many papers have been published by uh, many people across the country even in from nin where we have done lot of studies in schools and we found high intake of uh, all these uh, food items uh, this is very important for indian uh, scenario uh, you can see here uh, this is again the life course approach for prevention of childhood obesity what we are seeing here is the dark line the x axis here is uh, the life course uh, the birth the uh, adolescence and the adulthood uh, uh, the risk uh, whereas the y axis what you are seeing is the um, risk uh, from uh, through the life course what is happening in the uh, lower income countries and high income countries or lower middle income countries and high income countries uh, we uh, as you see there the risk of obesity is increased from birth in low income countries compared with high income countries uh, as a result of uh, parental malnutrition low birth weight and stunting and so on so these factors will precipitate uh, faster rise in obesity levels in our uh, uh, coming generations the greater mismatch occurs on the transition to a low middle income countries so as populations move from lower income to middle income uh, and a higher income this, this is what is going to happen so uh, this is uh, where we have a potential to prevent uh, as you see here these diagrams three diagrams what they are representing is as the nations move from low to middle income societies <clears throat> this graph what you are seeing the black one is what is going to happen something like your lead time uh, how it uh, helps you in uh, early diagnosis and screening the dotted line is something like your screening helps prevention of uh, uh i mean uh, early picking up of a disease very similarly is 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 the time for us to act if we can act in the adolescent age group now the uh, the uh, the uh, the prediction is not that we are going to have the black line 
of uh, higher obesity levels rather it will be the uh, continuation of the same level or even lower level the gro uh, the gray line so this is a very interesting uh, uh, thing because uh, uh, we all know where, what are the various uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, high dense uh, foods energy dense foods that will precipitate the uh, obesity but uh, this is a, just a comparison of uh, uh, life course again how uh, the linda is a girl uh, with proper nutrition uh, on the left side and sara is uh, this is from unicef uh, state of worlds uh, uh, world children 2019 uh very uh, nicely predicted uh, from newborn between 0 to 6 months the nutritional needs proper maternal nutrition and uh, exclusive breastfeeding uh, without this uh, the future impact will be a mother who is malnourished during pregnancy increased risk of preterm birth and uh, low birth weight uh, whereas linda's mother is healthy and has a job with maternity leave that allows her to exclusively breastfeed for the first 6 months so i'm not talking further because the first 1000 days is being uh spoken by another uh, uh, speaker so just to compare uh, whereas sara's mother is struggling with anemia she has uh, returned to work shortly after giving birth uh, uh which means she is able to uh, she is not able to give exclusive breastfeeding so this continues throughout this child as she grows uh, this will happen between 6 months to 4 years the child should have had uh, the diverse foods like uh, breastfeeding uh nutritious complementary foods like meat fish eggs dairy fruits vegetables legumes and nuts but uh, because this is not provided malnutrition early childhood can impact brain development cognition and uh, school performance in late childhood as this child reaches 5 to 9 years uh because of lack of these diverse food groups proper nutrition uh overweight and obesity has become a short term and long term physical and mental health effects so similar to what we are facing with stunting we are going to face with overweight and obesity uh the same child as through her adolescence this is what we she will go through again there are no diverse diets boys need more nutrients to fuel greater gain in the bone and muscle mass so appropriate supplementation of various micronutrients all this when they don't happen undernourished adolescents are more likely to miss school suffer cognitivity and also uh, psychologically then obesity during this time can contribute to early onset of cognitive dysfunction and during aging so this is what uh, we are going to continue to face so uh, the food systems i'm sure all of you are aware so i'm, I'm not going to uh, prolong this uh, but uh, this is very important because we all know as uh, uh, why kids are so much attracted why only kids all of us are attracted for all kinds of food items uh, food uh, things that are marketed in the uh, whatever is available in the market Uh, is basically because the food system is uh, through uh, moving this way as you can see this uh, picture a pictorial uh, represent pictorial representation of the uh, food system uh, on the left side we are seeing the food uh, food supply chains the production production of food what is being produced in india is it more cereal based or uh, millet based or pulses or what are the other uh, diverse foods we can give then storage and distribution then processing and packaging retail and markets all this contribute to obesity indirectly then as you see the yellow square there personal food environment individual and households accessibility to food affordability of food the convenience of availability of food to the kids and the families to mothers to give to the lunch to the kid all these effect then as you see the blue one in the uh, lower uh, segment external food environment like availability of food price of food so there are marketing uh, dynamics then uh, quality and safety of food marketing and regulation of food then finally as we see the gray, the maroon square there the behavior of the caregiver children and adolescents here it also includes not only the uh, families but also the schools and the systems where these uh, kids grow and even for that matter adults where they work and where they live for uh, most of their life these are this, uh, affected by socio economic characteristics inter intra household dynamics then the acceptability and the desirability of food food preparation and eating patterns all these affect the obesity so this is what you can get in the uh, nn website where uh, the complete uh, uh, my plate for the day has been devised where uh, this is a very good uh, representation of what is to be given in what proportions to adults the same thing we can also get uh, as a, uh, both for uh, uh, ers and uh, uh, what we call as a, this is what is er i'll just show once 
so that you'll understand better. This is estimated average requirement and recommended dietary allowance and tolerable upper limits. So these are the three uh, modalities what we use now currently in public health nutrition, where RDA we use uh, recommended diet relevance we'll use to intake goals for families. Usually in practice, we follow this. Whereas the uh, estimated average requirements will be used in nutritional researchers to assess the nutrient adequacy of groups. This is almost like uh, the median uh, requirement in the populations. Uh, mainly used for fortification, the nutrition education programs. Tolerable upper limits are those which are used to urge caution in the consumption of uh, upper uh, uh, limits, so that uh, which can lead to excessive nutrition intake. So you, the, you, all these you'll get in the website, uh, the summary of uh, requirements in uh, both the groups. Then uh, these are the publications that are available online. You can also purchase them, where for different age groups, as you can see, for children, it is there, infants, in fact, women, children, for everybody, it is available. So these are the other areas where we, uh, NN is working in public health, nutrition, clinical uh, division we have, maternal child health. Excuse me, sir. And, yeah. Uh, sorry, if we can move a little faster. Yeah, this is the last two slides. Okay, so okay, uh, these are the various areas where we can collaborate. Uh, like, uh, uh, because you have uh, 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 urban rural health centers and uh, your clinical, this thing. You can always collaborate with us. We, uh, I'm personally, my, I myself, I'm working in the area of uh, overweight and obesity surveillance systems, uh, which are scalable and sustainable because that will be the requirement for future, which will help us in identify those populations which are at high risk of uh, getting malnutrition in the form of obesity. So that's the end of this presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a really insightful presentation. You beautifully outlined the nutrition transition and the evolving epidemic uh, within the pandemic in the global context. Uh, now I would like to uh, invite our chairperson, Professor Suraka Kishor Ma'am and Professor Arun Nagarwal sir, if are there any expert comments and suggestions regarding uh, this topic. Professor Suraka to go first, please. I Am I audible? Am yes. I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Swamya. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank all the organizing team for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. And uh, right now we are going to have a speaker, Dr. Sai Ram, who is scientist of National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. Uh, he has completed his MD in Community Medicine from Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad, and has worked on hypertension control among geriatric population in urban slums of Hyderabad and state coverage evaluation of child vaccination program by UNICEF. Uh, currently, he is pursuing research in nutritional interventions through primary health care, social determinants of malnutrition, tuberculosis, malnutrition, and interplay of malnutrition, infectious diseases, and non-communicable diseases in communities. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sai Ram. Ma'am, ma uh, the, the session has been finished. Uh, if uh, we can have uh, some discussion over that. Uh, he had talked over the role of nutrition in childhood obesity. I, I heard that. I heard that. So, Dr. Sai Ram, I, I would like to uh, just uh, ask you a few things uh, related to what you have presented. Uh, uh, see, you have uh, spoken about uh, the obesity, and uh, uh, one thing um, I would just like to ask you, as far as uh, you know, this uh, webinar is concerned, uh, which is related to the front of package label on World Obesity Day, and we are addressing the childhood obesity, have you ever, uh, you know, uh, 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 had uh, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, study or research which has shown any relationship of, uh, you know, uh, the use of junk food, which is related to obesity, especially in rural areas? Thank you, madam. Focusing uh, on rural, rural areas. Yeah, yeah, madam, thank you so much. Uh, we did studies in a few schools uh, in urban areas. Uh, as far as the, the uh, front of uh, uh, 
pack labeling is concerned, we are doing a multi-centric study now that's ongoing. In rural areas, uh, uh, we we did not uh, find so much of uh, uh, consumption of uh, junk food in the rural areas, but uh, we did not conduct major studies in the rural areas. Most of the studies related to junk food were in the school based in the urban areas. Uh, one more thing uh, uh, which is coming up right now is, uh, you know, uh, like especially during the COVID time, uh, uh, you know, uh, the use of junk food and, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, packaged food has increased. Uh, any uh, information related to that, whether, uh, you know, uh, the increase in obesity during the COVID time uh, due to the use of this? Maybe in urban or in rural? Yeah, ma'am. Actually, there are international studies where uh, they have shown uh, uh, there is increase in BMI, uh, mean BMI before and after COVID in many countries. Uh, we are having data. We have collected all over the uh, state of uh, Telangana. So we, we are uh, doing a study here. Uh, we are in the process of analysis. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, your, uh, you know, uh, an excellent presentation. And uh, though I, I joined uh, five minutes later after you had uh, started the presentation, I had a meeting with WHO people. So uh, it was a good presentation and you have uh, really comprehensively presented the role of nutrition in childhood obesity with all your pictorial graphs and, uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, information which you have delivered was really good and uh, relevant to the subject. And uh, uh, on behalf of my co-chair, I uh, am very thankful to you and as well as congratulate for, for such a beautiful and excellent presentation. So thank you, Dr. Sairam. Thank you very much, ma'am. So Dr. Sairam, I have a, a couple of, uh, not questions, but curiosities. Sure, sir. I mean, your presentation was such a nice presentation based upon thorough literature search. You have actually supplemented your thoughts with all the peer-reviewed articles. So this was really very insightful. But I'm thinking that if I am a public health practitioner and I have to do some intervention or if I am parent to the kids of this age group, so the carry home message from your uh, presentation would be that uh, you mentioned that uh, those who are malnourished, stunted around 30-40%, they are actually at higher risk and that is what you showed that lower middle income country, they start very early on the path and the higher income country are late because our 30-40% population is malnourished and they become high risk of uh, developing overweight and obesity. And then linked with this is that you sh showed that CISA, that high calorie rich density food and the activities and there is a cross tilt in that. So if as public health practitioner, I have to devise strategies, how to tackle this malnourished uh, children I mean, they have, although this is life cycle approach, you start from the antenatal period, but suppose we have missed that train. We have low birth weight or even if it is normal birth weight, but then we discover that these babies are stunted. Then what type of strategies should be in place right from the beginning so that we can make some impact on that high rising curve or uh, we, it's very easy to say don't take junk food and this and that and do activity. But in, with your experience, can you suggest what is a workable model? Workable, not a theoretical model. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's a very pertinent question. As you rightly said, uh, those two are the models uh, which are proving true. Uh, one is uh, the nutritional transition. Uh, uh, what they have found in West is... Uh, the most of these Western countries, they have plateaued, uh, but they miss the train. We are we are not yet missed the train. We are still having a chance. The strategies include both the community and the uh, uh, we have uh, the 
setting based models for example this is not model this is worked in other countries also where uh, schools and uh, even not only for kids in fact for uh, adults the systems where we grow and live for example the schools where kids grow most spend most of their time where they are educated uh, this has worked well in some countries uh, school based surveillance systems where we identify the populations which are at high risk and uh, because that's where we can uh, modify their behavior but then it has to be complemented at family level also so we need both the uh, models of both the community based where mothers can be trained in this and also the uh, teacher the school environment because somebody will be speaking about obesogenic environments and speak about it uh, those obesogenic environments in the schools colleges where where, where these kids will grow to become uh, uh, young adults uh, if we can target that there are uh, possibilities that we can bend this curve thank you thank you uh, thank you sir uh, thank you ma'am uh, for your suggestions and opinion uh, now we'll be moving to the uh, next uh, session uh, the next topic which is obesity in pregnancy it would be taken over by dr sanjay kalra dm endocrinology uh, new delhi and frcp edinburgh he is now working as a consultant at bharti hospital karnal and a visiting professor at aims rishikesh he is the president elect of uh, south asian federation of endocrine societies and uh, he is a section editor of many books on endocrinology and he is a member of program organizing committee of international congress of endocrinology singapore 22 his hobbies are the traditional haryanvi mugdar and the bhangra uh, over to you kalra sir please thank you sir for that warm introduction and uh, thank you also for this invitation to be part of the aims batenda team we'll be speaking today about something that is very important we'll be talking about obesity and pregnancy now we are all aware of uh, the importance of obesity and the the entire audience everyone who is gathered here is aware that obesity is too important too important to be left to the obesity specialist alone that is why public health has taken the lead public health has taken the lead and it's leading from the front and if we don't do that actually we are going to lose our fight against obesity but once we are all on board public health specialists policy makers politicians as well physicians para professional staffs persons living with obesity their peers their partners when all of us come on board then we are able to create a team a team that will not stop and a team that will actually be able to manage obesity it is easy to say this and like our chair person said uh, theoretical models are different practical are different so practically how is it that we are able to motivate people to manage their obesity manage their weight how do you motivate will come later that is a motivational theory and we can discuss those separately but you have to have a motivation in place so let us look at phases of life as a child what do i think of obesity or what does my mother think what do my parents think as an adolescent what do i think as a person of marriageable age as a person who is planning a family what do i think as an elder person as middle aged for each of these phases we have different motivational tricks and tips an adolescent would not be motivated if you said you know young man uh, you must lose weight otherwise you will develop heart disease he is least bothered but if you tell him young man lose weight and suddenly you will become the most sought after bachelor in your class all the girls will run after you and now that is something which will motivate the boy to lose weight for those of us across 50 we have different motivational reasons for trying to lose weight but there is one phase of life where it is quite easy to motivate whether it is polycystic ovary syndrome whether it is gestational diabetes young ladies young women do want to lose weight so today let's talk about obesity and pregnancy we'll talk of pregnancy we'll talk of fertility and then we'll talk of what we can do in a practical way in a pragmatic way to help reduce the burden of obesity in our country and worldwide we are all aware of the definition of obesity as defined by who but in asian indians we have lower cutoffs 23 for overweight and 25 for obesity this is not arbitrary the reason is that the moment we cross 23 and 25 our risk of cardiovascular disease goes up 
our risk of all cause mortality goes up so that is why we have these cutoffs and if we are able to come below these cutoffs our risk actually reduces when we use the term maternal obesity we are speaking of non pregnant women of reproductive age and do remember that when you are checking bmi in a normal person you check height and weight and then you calculate the formula if it is a pregnant lady you will check the pre pregnancy weight because in pregnancy weight is going to go up so whether the lady is in second or third trimester the bmi will be defined according to pre conception weight in pregnancy what you look at is weight gain so weight gain throughout pregnancy weight gain during the trimesters this is what we aim at you don't count the bmi number anymore you just look at weight in kg i would like to mention here a medical fact and that is that in public health many of you would be aware of the uh, obesity paradox there is a u shaped curve if you are very obese then mortality goes up if you are really underweight then also mortality goes up so you it is good to remain in the middle zone we call it the goldilocks zone so neither should you be too big you should not be double xl or triple xl size you should also not be small you should not be thin and lean you should remain in that goldilocks zone the middle zone but when you look at the epidemiological data regarding waist circumference that is not u shaped that is linear so the more the waist circumference the more the mortality the less the weight circumference the less the mortality and this is a simple thing which reminds us that we should focus not only on obesity but also on central obesity these things are important for public health because they help us speak the same language the right language with our population with all the people with whom we connect it is also important because this brings to four gender disparities so obesity impacts men it impacts women but it impacts women even more women who are obese have a greater chance of uh, premature mortality and there are multiple factors which lead to this polycystic ovary syndrome the use of drugs hormonal drugs for contraception for infertility management these can precipitate obesity gradually breast feeding is reducing so the lesser the breast feeding duration the more the chances of obesity at menopause obesity increases and amongst all these the most important is pregnancy pregnancy can lead to weight gain and also postpartum practices can lead to weight gain this gender inequality is important not only from a biomedical point of view but also from a psychosocial point of view women in general girls in general are more prone to social discrimination because of their weight there may be a greater impact on their quality of life and if we are aware of these we can use these factors to our advantage do not feel that they are obstacles or hindrances to good health view them as an opportunity and now look at this opportunity for aims batinda national health uh, family health survey 4 telling us that obesity is prevalent across the country but there are some districts where it is more prevalent these happen to be barnala moga faridkot all neighbors of batinda so you have an opportunity such a high prevalence of obesity and if we just communicate the right message we will get the best possible results we would want aims batinda and of course uh, to our chairperson ma'am we would want aims gorakhpur also and aims rishikesh to rise as uh, shining beacons of good health in in the public health sphere and this opportunity is there it is just ripe for the taking many times our public will tell us uh, you know in a very fatalistic way डॉक्टर साहब नथिंग कैन बी डन माई जीन्स आर लाइक दैट मुझे विरासत में ओबेसिटी मिली बट इट इज नॉट ओनली अबाउट विरासत इट इज नॉट अबाउट जीन्स इट इज ऑल्सो अबाउट एनवायरमेंट इट इज अबाउट वातावरण तो अगर आप विधि का विधान बदलना चाहें तो आप एक्चुअली बदल सकते हैं यू कैन चेंज इट बाई चेंजिंग द एनवायरमेंट एंड वन आवर स्पीकर विल टॉक अबाउट द फर्स्ट थाउजेंड डेज ऑफ लाइफ the first 1000 days of life they begin with the implantation of the fetus it is right at that time that we should focus on maternal lifestyle not even at that time even before con conception we should be doing that because if you give the right maternal environment you will be able to prevent epigenetic modifications which will worsen obesity 
you will be able to have a good gut microbiome. You will be able to prevent cellular inflammation. And all these things will improve the health, not only of the mother herself, but also of the unborn child. Again, let me spend a minute on gut microbiome. This is something of great public health importance and clinical importance. We have trillions of bacteria in our gut. Man has been able to reach the moon. Soon we will reach Mars. We know more about the moon and about Mars than we know about our own bacteria. And actually, the microbiome in our gut is known as our second nervous system. There is an enteral, E-N-T-E-R-A-L, enteral nervous system, which has as many connections as the autonomic or sensory or motor nervous system or the central nervous system. So this is our second nervous system. It is also our second gene pool because there is more genetic material inside our gut than there is in the rest of the body. Is this an obstacle? Is this an opportunity? We have to study to find out. It is also our second endocrine system. Let me give an example. You look at serotonin. We all think that serotonin comes from the brain. That is true. It does. Serotonin influences our mood, our happiness. But 90% of the body serotonin is produced by bacteria in the gut. So if you want a dose of happiness, D-O-S-E, D for dopamine, O for oxytocin, S for serotonin, and E for endorphins. If you want a dose of happiness, some people go for yoga, they go for meditation. Others may go for psychotropic drugs. The ones which act on serotonin, maybe like um, duloxetine. Others may go for other pharmaceutical interventions for which Urta Punjab is famous. So again, Ames Batinda has more work to do. But would not the simplest be that we just focus on our gut microbiome? 250 grams of curd twice a day, 300 grams of curd just once a day, ek paya dahi. Iske saath ab apne gut, gut microbiome ko khush rakhe, aur fir dekhe ke serotonin kitna ban raha hai. And that will create happiness. So just to repeat, the second endocrine system, the second nervous system and the second gene pool of our body lies in the gut. And if we can take care of this, if we can take care of the maternal environment, we will be able to change epigenetics of genetics. And that is one very important way of fighting obesity. How do we motivate people, families and women to fight obesity? The data is there in front of us. We just have to share in an empathic manner, in an empathic, non-judgmental manner, but in an effective manner. The more obese a lady is, the lesser the chances of conception. The more obese the lady is, the more the chances of anovulation. Eggs will not form. Even if we go for infertility treatment, the more obese the lady, the less the chances of success. Ovulation rate is much lesser in people who are in women who are obese. Let us say routine traditional medication did not work and you go for IVF treatment. The more obese the lady, the less the chances of success in IVF. So these are the data. Now, how do you approach this? One way to, would be to say instead of three cycles, I will go for five cycles of IVF. But would it not be simpler? to lose weight in the preconception phase. And if the entire family is so much worried about pregnancy, so much of pressure from the mother-in-law, from the mother, from all friendly onlookers, from the entire uh, entire Bhatinda city, you know, pura, pura ka pura mohalla bhi bada hai, ji, baby kab doge, good news kab suna hoge. So if you are so interested, why not focus on weight loss? Why not create an environment which actually helps promote weight loss and healthy living? Most people will accept this data. Some will say, I want to learn more. So we teach them. Maternal obesity will reduce the quality of the oocyte. It will negatively impact the quality of the endometrium. The adipose tissue will produce adipokines, which are pro-inflammatory, which lead to insulin resistance, which will also cause infertility. And there will be a negative impact on the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus will not produce the hormones in the right manner. It will also impact the liver 
and fatty liver because of fatty liver we will have lesser uh, sex hormone binding globulins and lesser igf1 bp and all these put together will impact fertility now that was one aspect of motivating our ladies our public but then someone will say i am obese i have already become pregnant why should i listen to all that you are saying it becomes even more important during pregnancy because for obese women the chances of miscarriage or abortion are more the higher the weight the more the chances of mis uh, of uh, miscarriage and the odds ratio is 3.5 any kind of negative maternal or negative neonatal outcome that you look at it is more common in obese women so even if a lady says i am not worried about myself i don't care whether i get gestational diabetes gestational hypertension or cesarean at least you are worried about your baby do you want your baby to have iugr do you want your baby to be preterm do you want him or her to get jaundice or hypoglycemia and get admitted in hospital in uh, icu in nicu uh, if yes you go ahead if no then why not lose your weight before pregnancy gdm is another epidemic that we are facing these days and even for gdm the main reason behind the surge in this epidemic is obesity obesity is one of the highest ranking risk factors for gdm along with being of southeast asian ethnicity and also having family history of diabetes let us say we went through pregnancy even then at the end there is a risk there is a greater risk of cesarean a greater risk of stillbirth and a greater risk of fetal death so these are unfortunate things but if we are able to counsel our patients early on that you can optimize this you can optimize your metabolism then the results are good it is not that we want to keep all pregnant women hungry in pregnancy we need to develop anabolic stores we need to we need to fulfill the metabolic demands of the mother and the fetus but we can do that very easily by following a healthy diet we should also remind our patients uh, women coming to the antenatal clinic that whatever you do today will impact not only your health today and your health tomorrow but also your child's health tomorrow if you are obese the chances of your child developing metabolic syndrome are higher sometimes they don't understand all this so we use the term transgenerational karma now in hindi in sanskrit the word karma or karma it is past tense present tense and future tense aapne jo karma kal kiye aapne cigarette pee आपने एक्सरसाइज नहीं की उसकी वजह से आप आज के कर्म एक्सपीरियंस कर रहे हैं आपका वेट बढ़ गया शुगर हो गई ब्लड प्रेशर हो गया जो आज आप कर्म करेंगे आप एक्सरसाइज करेंगे या नहीं ये वाला आज का आप वेबिनार सुनेंगे या नहीं इन कर्मों की वजह से आपके कल के कर्म डिसाइड होंगे दैट इज मेटाबोलिक कर्म हेल्थ कर्म ग्लाइसिमिक कर्म यू कैन यूज वट एवर वर्ड यू वॉन्ट एंड दिस इज समथिंग विच वी वुड रिक्वेस्ट ऑल पब्लिक हेल्थ प्रोफेशनल टू प्रोपिगेट इन द कंट्री ये इंडियन फिलोसफी है इट इज सेक्युलर फिलोसफी विच ऑल ऑफ अस अंडरस्टैंड एंड विच वी ऑल विल रेजोनेट विद बट प्रेगनेंसी इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट प्ले ग्राउंड फॉर कर्म बिकॉज हेयर यू हैव ट्रांस जनरेशनल कर्म अलाउ मी टू स्पेंड वन मिनट ऑन दिस अवर कलीग्स इन ऑबस्टेटिक्स एंड गाइनी विल एग्री दैट इफ यू आर एबल टू मैनेज ए बी सी डी ई द पेशेंट्स हिमोग्लोबिन anemia blood pressure that is avoid pih avoid eclampsia circumference abdominal circumference or abdominal girth c is for circumference but what i mean by this is weight gain during pregnancy neither too much nor too little follow the goldilocks zone d for diabetes and e for endocrine health especially thyroid if you can make sure that the lady before conception and during conception is able to manage her anemia blood pressure circumference diabetes and thyroid endocrine then she will actually have not only good health for herself but also good health for the fetus and good health for the unborn fetus that offspring will also have better health transgenerational transgenerational karma is something that resonates with all of us 
Another thing that resonates is Abhimanyu syndrome. And we all know this from our philosophy, from our history. So if you are able to take good care of the Abhimanyu in your womb, but it has to be complete, you cannot say that I will take care of my hemoglobin, but I will not take care of my calcium. I will take the thyroid medicine, but I will not take the diabetes diet. It has to be all together. Then your child, the child who is yet to be born, will be able to enter the chakra view and will be able to come out of the chakra view of metabolic syndrome. So this is something that we should repeat again and again in our community, amongst our peers and to the world at large. If we can do this, then now we can catch maternal obesity and we can prevent obesity in the coming generation. We should not focus so much on weight loss because if you remember that U-shape that we spoke about, that works here in pregnancy as well. If large babies are at greater risk of diabetes, IUGR babies are also at greater risk of diabetes. An IUGR baby will have a smaller pancreas, lesser pancreatic reserve, and more chances of pancreatic failure or insulinopenia in life. So not too much of weight loss is required during pregnancy. Whatever weight loss is required, you should do that before pregnancy. Do remember that the entire beta cell mass in an adult is only one gram. One gram pe puri ki body, puri ki puri body chalti hai. So if that is impacted during the uh, intrauterine development, then you are in trouble. And there is a lot of difference between 1 gram and 0 0.8 gram. So we have to take care of that 1 gram. And this is repeated across the world. Preconception weight management is more important. Ensure sustainable lifestyle changes. Encourage women to enter pregnancy with a low BMI. Let them lose 5 to 7 to 10 percent of their BMI before planning conception. And once they have done that, then they should try to maintain weight gain in pregnancy as per this slide. If it is an underweight lady, we would want her to gain between 12 and 18 kg. If it is normal weight, something like 10 to 15 kg. But if it is overweight or obese lady, then the weight gain comes down. Then you would be satisfied with a weight gain of 5 to 10 kg. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. If you can yes. move a bit faster. Yes, done well. And we should keep on monitoring our patients for this before, during, and after delivery as well. So before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after delivery. Because in the postpartum phase, that is another phase where your patients will be very happy with you. And they would want to return to their pre-pregnancy weight within 12 months, or at least before the next pregnancy. So in summary, this is what we've spoken about. We've spoken about the importance of obesity, the importance of maternal obesity, and the importance of tackling it. And once again, I would like to thank the Public Health Fraternity of India and especially Ames Patinda for taking up this challenge. Lead from the front and we all are with you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay sir. It is always a pleasure listening to you. It was really an enlightening uh, presentation from your part. We have uh, really moved from undernutrition in pregnancy to a part where we are going to overnutrition in pregnancy. Uh, so, uh, Respected uh, ma'am and uh, Arun Nagarwal, sir, if uh, due to the paucity of time, we can move forward. We can take questions in the last. Sure. I mean, move forward. This was a wonderful yeah. presentation. Congratulations to Dr. Sanjay for giving such insightful concepts. Uh, we will discuss sometime later, not here, but uh, we will like to be in touch with you, with your how you have linked Hindu mythology with the science. Great. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir and ma'am. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, sir. Uh, so moving to our uh, next topic of the lecture, uh, which is quite important, the relevance of early 1,000 days in childhood obesity. The speaker is Dr. Joel David Tilak, uh, Tilak Singh. Uh, he is a consultant, diabetologist, and endocrinologist uh, at the San Fernando Teaching Hospital in Trinidad and Tobacco, West Indies. He has received his specialist training in uh, UK, and he is the host of the live weekly television public health program, which is Ask the Doctor. And uh, he is a 
uh, writer of a daily column of the COVID chlorinkles in the Trinidad Guardian. Over to you, Dr. Joel, sir, please. Hello, thank you very much for that warm welcome. So it is a pleasure, so it is an honor to be a part of this esteemed panel. I don't know if you're hearing me, Pam, is that okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, we can hear. Great, but thank you very much. So we've been hearing from um, doctors Sairam and Kalra about a burgeoning, growing um, global epidemic of childhood obesity. And we've been grappling with this problem in the West Indies. And part of the diaspora, part of the Indian um, group that has traveled as laborers into the West Indies in places like Trinidad and Tobago, um, that, that continues to grapple with this problem similar to other parts of the Western world. So next. And we've been speaking about this global epidemic of childhood obesity. And, and we could talk about the problems of bird flu, COVID-19, global warming. People have been talking about a threat that is growing near to you all with Russia and Ukraine. But obesity remains perhaps the biggest risk factor for chronic NCDs around the world. And that's why I want to congratulate our public health team for World Obesity Day to recognizing this problem um, of childhood obesity and addressing it at that first 1,000 days. Dr. Kalra Sir mentioned about um, focusing on the woman, on the woman pre pregnancy and during that time of gestation. And I want to extend that to perhaps the first thousand days, the first two to three years of life that seems to have a great impact, not just on the developing brain, but also may increase the risk for um, increasing body weight in the future. Next, please. So in terms of the definition of childhood obesity, and we have heard it that it may vary based on what part of the world that we're in, but a body mass index exceeding the 98th centile, I'm obese, or um, most of the patients would be obese overweight at that point when the BMI is more than a 98th centile. Next. And the percentage of obese children becoming obese adults, it's almost as if um, the events which occur within the first 1,000 days set the tone, set the pace. It's remarkably prescient in that those children will be more likely to be obese as so as adults, and as we know, the plethora of medical complications are more likely to occur at an earlier age. It's almost like you're looking at a car crash in slow motion at that point. Children within the first 1,000 days, the increasing risk for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, um, lipid issues, and of course, premature vascular disease. Next, please. The, the views of childhood obesity globally, the views have changed. And these, these, are, these are pictures taken from um, a movie in 1971, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Roald Dahl's classic. And uh, the, the chubby guy in this story in 1971 um, is portrayed on the left and on the right, the remake of that film, so the image, the view that we have of what is, um, is, of what is re regarded as childhood obesity has changed. So it's almost like the mindset, the preconceived notion that we have in westernized cultures and have subsequently adopted in places like Asia and the West Indies, that has changed too, the mindset and the view, just inspection, just looking at someone, the waist circumference. So we don't even have to check the BMI anymore that we may say that a chubby child is a healthy child. Sometimes even the grandparents and parents believe that that actually reflects health. As we know now, that is, it's setting a tone for trouble. Next. And next as well. Now, no talk, no talk um, in, on childhood obesity would be enough, would be complete without me speaking about the diet that we sometimes give to children in those first 1,000 days. And there is a, a book in the West Indies by a Scottish 
physician who worked in the 1940s in Trinidad and Tobago. Now we know that, now you would know about the Queen's Park Oval because of the West Indies team and so many players in IPL. But this doctor noticed um, a problem arising amongst the indentured laborers who had traveled from India following the, the abolition of slavery. And I just thought it was relevant to quote that he was looking at the breakfasts by the Indian indentured laborers at that point, and it would frighten anyone with a stomach smaller than an elephant's. Flapjacks with a pound of flour, perhaps at that point, referring to um, the, the rotis or nans, enormous amounts of boiled rice with vegetables boiled in oil, and a, a host of carbohydrate-rich, sugary, starchy, and foods high in saturated fat eating sugar by the pound, and that diet inculcated into his children's meal plans. The carbohydrate intoxication may cause a spurious type of diabetes. Next. And when we approach childhood obesity, or in terms of obesity in general, um, and everyone needs to get involved as the theme for World Obesity Day for 2022. And there are five A's, which I think would be relevant. And we're talking within the first 1,000 days of childhood obesity or the first 1,000 days of life. And this is relevant perhaps to the parents at that point that you're asking, you're asking persons whether or not they would be open to discussing their weight. Public health depends on public trust. And we've seen this, we, we have seen this for all diseases. It's relapsing, remitting problems and asking and perhaps trying to eliminate the stigma associated with increasing body weight, obesity, advising about the risks of obesity. Dr. Calera mentioned that at different stages in life, um, what is important to people will vary. So a child, may find that, that the goals, the expectations, the value for weight loss would be different. Um, someone who is at university level, someone who is older, someone who is planning marriage and the benefits of healthy weight and that discussion may be different. Assessing the health status and so important for psychosocial factors. We know that the fact that persons who may be overweight will have an increased risk for anxiety, depression, Persons who have even polycystic ovaries often tend to have me um, mental health problems. In fact, that, that might, might actually be a part of the metabolic syndrome. Assisting and identifying resources and referring to appropriate providers. And I know in the second part of the symposium, we'll be talking a little bit about how, how it is that we can assist persons to cope with an obesogenic environment and arranging and identifying ways to executing the plan successfully. And one of these ways would be to address food labeling and that too will form a part of the symposium. So the five A's in approaching obesity in general. Next. And in terms of causes, we, we know that childhood obesity is a complex entity and it's not just a matter of um, in terms of the energy expenditure versus the energy in, it's a complex interplay amongst genetics, environment, social, cultural. We spoke about the fact that persons would think that a chubby child is a healthy child. Um, some um, younger persons in the West Indies would actually think that they would be more attractive so if they have increased body weight, and I've been told that by their partners, that losing weight implies that you may have AIDS, you may have cancer, you may have a disease entity. So there are social cultural aspects that doctors have to be aware of, particularly at the public health level, when we are discussing um, increasing body weight. Next, please. And the etiology, um, we know that there have been issues as we adopt a westernized culture, persons don't have time anymore to cook. Um, so very often that you're eating out a sugar sweetened beverages and supersizing everything. So we've been taught to be fat. We've been taught that we should substitute machines for muscles. We should have um, some, of, some of the high fat um, foods particularly as we, we, we heard in our first speaker in socially deprived areas. Next. And perhaps married with the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an increase in sedentary lifestyles and increased screen time. 
The virtual learning environment has been faltering, but our schools have remained shuttered in places like the West Indies. There's less emphasis on physical education and after school programs and perhaps more screen time. And that will be contributing to an increased risk of childhood obesity. So the so-called um, the so-called babysitter by the television set of the 1960s and 70s um, has been replaced by the iPads, the tablets, the telephones, the mobile phones and video games. And that has increased screen time. And that starts at an early age. So that starts sometimes within the first 1,000 days of life that children are now very adept at using these electronic devices. Next, please. So in terms of the history, now most of most patients, um, especially if we're assessing a child within, within the first 1,000 days, most patients will have simple or exogenous obesity, particularly if there's normal growth and development. If you're looking at obese short children who, who have slow growth, they may be a reduced IQ, dysmorphic features, um, they may have a syndrome, and we're thinking about problems like Prader-Willi syndrome, and may require further investigations by our pediatric colleagues. Increased body weight may suggest hyperinsulinism in utero. And an early age of obesity, if the patient was breastfed exclusively within the first six months um, before the age of two, suggests a genetic or syndromic cause. So that's important too to remember when assessing history. Next. The dietary history, so if the patient may have a ravenous appetite with a lack of satiety, perhaps a hypothalamic cause, the degree of physical activity, medications may be impacting on body weight, hypothalamal pituitary problems. If there is a family history of obesity, and we'll talk a bit about that shortly, and of course, you're screening for features of hyperglycemia and the psychosocial impact, um, and that extends beyond that 1,000 days. Next. The physical examination as part of a routine clinical assessment of such a patient, the height, weight, and body mass index, blood pressure, waist circumference. Of course, I'm always having at the back of our mind that it may not purely be simple or exogenous obesity, and there may be dysmorphic features that suggest an underlying genetic problem, perhaps, visual field defects, goiter, and proximal myopathy may also point towards um, secondary causes of obesity, some of the endocrine reasons, including um, thyroid problems and Cushing syndrome. Investigations are tailored towards what you would have elicited from history and physical examination findings, and bearing in mind that you don't want to send persons on an excursion of very expensive and unnecessary investigations. So just routine screening, perhaps we want to screen, especially in a Southeast Asian setting, um, for your glucose, your hemoglobin A1C, we're looking at lipids and liver function tests in childhood obesity in general, not just within the 1,000 days, and whether or not clinical, um, whether or not it's clinically indicated, you would want to consider doing certain hormones and avoiding over investigation in a rapidly growing child. And just a reminder about some of the complications of childhood obesity, next. So it's a problem that has been recognized for the past few decades, and we know that it's been exacerbated by COVID-19, next. And prevention, that watchword remains prevention. Public health demands public trust. I think that's a useful mantra for so many illnesses. And that's why, that's why I think so COVID-19 has actually um, escalated into such a problem around the world. There's been a lack of public trust. Um, and so, as we mentioned, a good clinical assessment, measuring and plotting the body mass index, and it's only done by 20% of primary care providers. So the pediatrics or colleagues are doing a better job at that. Identifying those at risk within the first 1,000 days, we'll talk about that, and guiding patients about nutrition, physical activity, and healthy lifestyle. So within the first 1,000 days, identifying the patients at risk, persons who may have accelerated infant weight gain, a family history of obesity, we've heard about the risk of obesity rising astronomically if both parents are obese, 
a high birth weight. So, but Dr. Talra was, was talking about talking to the pregnant patient, the pregnant woman. So about the role of her health and ensuring that she remains at a normal body weight, even preconception and during um, so pregnancy about healthy lifestyles. And that would reduce the chance once a blood glucose level remains normal, reduce the chance of fetal macrosomia. And of course, that harsh, hostile environment in utero that has been found to, to change the fetal pro programming, the DNA programming and the microbiome changes to, to the extent that the body weight, that the chance for childhood obesity is increased. And of course, all the metabolic disorders would also come um, along with that high maternal pre-pregnancy body mass index, also a very strong risk factor to increase the chance for childhood obesity in the first 1,000 days. Persons of a lower socioeconomic status, prenatal tobacco exposure, also creating that harsh um, in utero environment that will, that will increase the chance for um, childhood obesity, that's a strong risk factor for childhood obesity in so many meta-analyses, the ethnicity um, of the patient and environmental or social problems in which both of the parents are working. There is family stress, lack of safe play areas and little stimulation, little mental stimulation. They've actually found that happier parents, um, happier mothers are less likely to have children who are obese in the first 1,000 days. And perhaps one of the under-recognized risk factors for childhood obesity is child abuse. That's something that we don't talk about, but that increasing stress um, that a child is exposed to. Apart from, we could speak about the westernized lifestyles, we could talk about poor diets and sedentary lifestyles, but child abuse, um, serious life, adverse life events, that impact on the child in that first 1,000 days is more likely to increase the chance of obesity in the following years. So the treatment of pediatric obesity, of course, you're educating the patient and parents about obesity. And as we spoke about those five A's, the first thing is trying to break the stigma attached to talking about body weight and assessing the patient and family's readiness to make changes. And the treatment needs to be individualized, personalized in small steps. We're talking about being a life coach for this patient. And Dr. Calra um, is one of the life coaches for his patients and indeed perhaps many of the doctors around the globe. And being a life coach involves making a few changes at a time, baby steps, no pun intended. Next and encouraging the child's autonomy and self-regulation. So you're not actually trying to teach children to clean the plate, providing healthier choices within the first 1,000 days of life. You're actually inculcating healthy lifestyles at an early age and educating parents because they must be role models um, at that age group for children. Healthier snacks should be available at the home perhaps fruits and vegetables. And that's, that's impacted in the West Indies and in Asia, I would think, because of the fact that they are more expensive than the calorie dense, high fat, high sugar foods, reducing portion sizes and advising children to not skip too many meals so they're ravenous at so different points in life. An exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months if possible has definitely been found to reduce the incidence of childhood obesity. And it, it's interesting that so many of these formulas have been withdrawn at various points in places like the United States and Europe in the last few weeks because of bacterial contamination. So that's a separate issue, but perhaps it brings into the front of the role of breastfeeding and reducing not just the risk for childhood obesity, but so many infectious illnesses. For a child who will not be entering a formal clinic, and we're talking still about within the first 1,000 days, reducing screen time and a reduction in a sedentary lifestyle. And something simple like getting back to the family, that nuclear family within the 1960s, the extended family that so many of the Indian 
um, the diaspora would have in the West Indies, that extended family with grandparents, parents, and children, not just having a talk about, um, so about your day at school, that has an impact in reducing weight and increasing physical activity, avoiding animal fat, because that has been found to increase the chance for rebound, adiposity rebound. So um, the children may lose weight after the first year or two, and then there may be a rebound after the age of six. Next. And some of the patients may need to be referred to a formal obesity clinic, particularly if you're considering surgery. And that, of course, is a multidisciplinary approach. And it's highlighted by our theme for World Obesity Day that everybody needs to act. Next. Bariatric surgery in different populations as they're growing older, not within the first 1,000 days, and we're targeting the other modes of management. Next. And we'll be hearing about a pandemic within a pandemic in the second part of our symposium. And I just wanted to highlight that COVID-19 related obesity in children has certainly been exacerbated by a plethora of biological, psychological and social factors. And perhaps the social factors um, are underexplored and at an intergovernmental level, this is something that we need to be addressing um, in terms of the sedentary lifestyles, the, readily, the ready availability of foods. We're talking about changing labels. We'll be hearing a bit about that. And the impact, it's been found in places like the United States to reduce the intake of sugar sweetened beverages. But what about the psychological impact of someone who is doomed towards a life of anxiety, depression, loneliness, perhaps bullying, a low self-esteem, early pregnancy, um, and increased inflammation, and that's going to have a burden um, on increased or early premature vascular disease, and that's going to impact on the socioeconomic status of the country at that point. Next. So childhood obesity is not something to take lightly, so I just thought it's ironic that the two billboards would be side by side, that you're having a shopping spree advising you to go into a fast food environment while while being an advocate against um, the pandemic of childhood obesity. Next. And prevention remains the watchword. It's a multidisciplinary approach amongst the child, family, parents, the community, healthcare providers, and the government. And it's time that we recognize this, that within the first 1,000 days, and as we heard even before, the developing mother the family needs to integrate healthy lifestyles at an early age, because this is certainly going to be an, um, a problem. It's a burgeoning pandemic. It's a developing global epidemic, and it's going to be a socioeconomic and health disaster in the coming years as we move into a post-pandemic era. So be an advocate for our patients. Remove the stigma attached to childhood obesity, and I certainly wish you all the best the rest of this symposium. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Joel, for this spirited presentation. Uh, you really addressed the first 1,000 days in childhood, uh, how we have to tackle with it. Also, we, you <clears throat> made us aware about the situation in Trinidad and Tobacco. And uh, now I would request uh, our chairpersons, uh, Professor Suraka Kishore, ma'am, and Professor Arun Ragwal to give uh, uh, their suggestions and any questions if they can. Sureka. Yeah, uh, Dr. Joel, uh, congratulations for a very nice and uh, detailed uh, presentation. And uh, it was really a very good presentation. And I, I think that uh, we can take up all the questions later on as decided earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to hand over my mic to uh, Dr. Arun Kumar for his uh, expert comments, if any, please. Dr. Arun. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, ma'am. That uh, is there any other presentation? One more, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. One more, sir. So, I mean, as part. decided, we will have that presentation also. But a brief comment, no question. Again, I will like to congratulate uh, Dr. David for such a wonderful presentation. And uh, I mean, I would like to know that 
I mean, uh, at the end, that are there some indicators to measure the performance of that one gram thing, pancreas <laughs> that that makes us busy throughout the day, <laughs> put us at risk. So, what are the indicators to measure the performance of that one gram at birth? Maybe we discuss later if there is time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, as we move to our uh, next session, which will be uh, taken by Professor Rakesh Kakkar, uh, the role of front of package lab labeling in addressing childhood obesity. Madhuri, if you can move the slide. Madhuri, if you can move the slide, please. Please move to the next slide. Uh, just, just a second. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't get it. Uh, uh, so, uh, first, I would like to thank uh, both the speakers, uh, Dr. Surekha Kishore, Madam, and Dr. Arun Agrawal, sir, uh, for chairing this session. So, uh, without wasting much time, I will start uh, my session as the time is limited. So, uh, from earlier speaker, we are very well uh, know that uh, the NCDs are the major cause of uh, this mortality, and disability and morbidity. Um, we have double burden of disease, but uh, if you'll see the past, then this uh, obesity or the burden of non-communicable disease is increasing. So one in four Indians are at a risk of dying from NCD before they reach age 70. So if we can manage this uh, burden uh, or we can control this effectively, then we can increase the quality of life as well as uh, longevity of life. So we can have more life expectancy. So uh, now the trend is uh, uh, in some uh, coming slides, you'll see that the obesity is increasing in childhood and adolescence. And in coming years, this will be reflected in, in the form of many morbidities, uh, like uh, NCDs in the form of hypertension or diabetes and other things. So it is uh, the prime time where we can focus more towards decreasing this obesity. And what are the initiatives we are taking like uh, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about the FOPL, which will be further discussed during the uh, panel discussion. So uh, all these conditions like high blood pressure, fa high fasting blood sugar, obesity, these are closely related to unhealthy diets. And uh, this is because of uh, the obesogenic environment which has created by the uh, industries uh, for their profit. So, a lot of uh, in, um, attractive advertisements are, pro are broadcasted and especially during this COVID time uh, where our children were at home and they have uh, easy access to the screen time. So, they have spent a lot of time, a sedentary lifestyle they have adopted so with this has increased the chances of excessive intake of nutrient of public health concern. Uh, and because of widespread availability, affordability, and promotion of processed and ultra-processed food uh, with unhealthy nutritional profiles. So again, uh, I'll go quickly through this comprehensive national nutrition survey where you can see that uh, though we have a double burden of disease and uh, the earlier uh, we used to call some Bemaru states though they have come up uh, from that tag, but you can see the uh, obesity is comparatively less in few states like Jharkhand, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttarakhand, while 
it is more where the per capita income is quite high and overall the overweight and obesity is 3.7 percent among uh, five to nine years of age group and if we'll move further to the next slide we can see that uh, among 10 to 19 years of adolescent this is again, now is 4.8 percent and and this then Delhi, Goa, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala, though the awareness is not less, but the environment is like that, that they have affordability and easy accessibility to this food. So that is how uh, the obesity and overweight is increasing in these areas. So due to uh, attractive uh, advertisements like uh, beverages with a high sugar content and junk foods and uh, less of physical activity, uh, we are seeing such type of picture. So our screens of our uh, desktop is getting thinner and uh, the person sitting in front is getting fatter. So this is the trend now we are, we are observing. So now if we'll focus like some are uh, modifiable factor and others are non-modifiable factors. And uh, we can divide the factors at individual level, like in uh, blue line, where uh, we have behavioral factor, personal factor and uh, factors at uh, uh, family and peer factor level and other factors uh, in second row that is in orange line uh, we can see the factors at community level. Uh, this is due to the environment which we are creating, uh, the macro environment which we are creating, like due to uh, media, advertising and promotions, community practices and cultural practices. And uh, the third row, that is the pink row, uh, which is at the policy level. So we have to act at all the levels if we want to and decrease this burden. And if you want to really decrease the um, burden of non-communicable disease. So this is an opportunity that uh, all the participants of today's workshop, if they can work at different level as per their affiliations, and uh, maybe every uh, all others can focus more on towards the research and uh, awareness at their own individual level, family level, and at community level. So we have to basically work on multiple factors. Uh, we have to make a balance of energy intake and en energy expenditure. And in order to reduce the premature mortality by 25%, uh, we have to focus more towards the reduction of tobacco by 30%, blood pressure by 25%, salt intake by another 30%, and 10% uh, um, reduction in a harmful use of alcohol, and uh, more of physical activity we have to promote. In order to have a 0% um, increase in diabetes uh, by 2025, and uh, we should have all the available medicine uh, affordable and accessible. Uh, but our primary focus should always be towards the uh, primary prevention rather than going for secondary and tertiary. So this is a slide where we can see that uh, uh, we generate usually obesogenic environment at home. That is if we'll give too much of uh, uh, junk food to our children and uh, if they will spend too much time on television, video games, uh, then this will increase the uh, weight. This will have a weight gain and by uh, around 10 pound of weight gain, uh, there is a decrease uh, trend of uh, sedentary life. So with uh, more of such uh, exposure to such environment, this will increase the chances of obesity and which later in later life reflect in the form of various complications. 
So these all are the risk factors like increased frequency of eating away from home, uh, community environment that inhibits active living, increased screen time, food advertising, uh, overconsumption of uh, sugar sweetened beverages, decline in overall physical activity. So all these uh, activity in addition to decreased physical education and uh, um, recess time at school will add up to uh, this risk factor and ultimately will result in these uh, complications like heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes. So ultimately, uh, children will experience more of breathing difficulty, hypertension, cardiovascular, and other psychological effects. So we have to create an environment where uh, if uh, the gradient is steep, that is if, it, if policies and uh, uh, environment is not conducive, then uh, it will be difficult for person to achieve the healthy eating, healthy activity and healthy weight. So in order to provide a, um, such type of atmosphere, we have to make uh, policy changes and uh, efforts at the home level, community level, so that uh, changing the gradient will make it easier to change the behavior. So now coming to the main uh, agenda, to, uh, main that is the front of package labeling, which is a part of comprehensive policy approach needed to promote healthy diets and reduce overweight, obesity, and diet-related NCDs. So front of package labeling is a, thing which uh, uh, we are promoting uh, with uh, AIMS Rishikesh and we are partnering with it. And we have already sent a recommendation to the ministry while uh, our webinar at uh, an AIMS Rishikesh. So earlier the evidences were not there. So it was introduced in 2012, but uh, now a lot of literature is available and a lot of evidences are there that uh, uh, shows the impact of introduction of FOPL in the community. So like in Delhi, uh, they have uh, worked like uh, uh, they expressed the nutrient of concern in this form. Uh, so, so uh, so ev evaluation of Chile's law of food labeling and advertising on sugar sweetened beverages have shown that uh, purchases of high in beverages significantly declined following implementation of this food labeling and advertising law. So uh, in this graph, you can see that uh, overall, there's a decline of 23.7% due to uh, implementation of this warning label, and which is uh, in high school uh, in children's over high school, or in colleges, the decline is significant due to this warning. So the use of FAPL led to a substantial reduction in the mortality and morbidity because if we'll make uh, community aware of uh, these changes, then uh, the important thing is that these should be easily understandable at every level so that even illiterate people can understand the meaning. So the sugar and sodium content of purchased packet food uh, was lower for combined FOPL versus no FOPL. So uh, if we'll make people aware of uh, these findings, then there is a trend for lower energy and saturated um, fat packaged food will be available and automatically these industries will also focus on these areas to make available the uh, healthy foods. 
So this uh, again was introduced by the FSSAI in 2018 with a different symbols, nutrient profiling models. And uh, even today, uh, and, uh, with a lot of pressure from different sectors, now work is going on uh, with the factories, but uh, there's a long way to go. So if uh, we'll make aware everyone about the FOPL, then uh, we can have a low in saturated and trans fats and uh, sugar and sodium available at uh, market outlets for most efficient. So this is the most efficient tool of influencing the consumer behavior. In a study done by NIN also, uh, this has been observed that people are, uh, have limited knowledge about the uh, and nutritional literacy for choosing these type of food. So this should be very uh, much understandable or interpretative FOPL is required. So interpretative FOPL, which provides a judgment on a set of nutrients. So there are two type of uh, uh, ways of presenting FOPL. That is one is interpretative, second is reductive. So the reductive form is difficult to understand while interpretative form is easy to understand. So these are the various forms of representation where you can see the red one shows the high content of uh, uh, nutrients of concern so that one can avoid these uh, foods. Huh? Like uh, if sugars are expressed in high quantity, then diabetic can avoid or if the salts are high, then hypertensives can avoid such type of foods. So I think uh, the time is less, so I'm moving a uh, little faster. So these are the areas, uh, nutrients of concern like uh, salt, sugar, saturated fats, trans fats, and cholesterol. And uh, what is the number of serving per pack and serving size? So this is how we can uh, show the high fat, sugar, and salt content in red so that one can choose it easily. So this voluntarily lab, uh, labeling has to be promoted at even at the food industry level so that uh, if they will convince and they will uh, also partner with our uh, government and uh, public health agencies for uh, decreasing uh, this epidemic. So mandatory front of labeling, uh, pack labeling is must. And uh, though industries are using all their tactics to delay, divide, deflect, and deny this challenge. Uh, and our aim should be to focus uh, people. Uh, we have to make them aware about the BMI so that they can maintain ideal uh, BMI and by adopting a healthy practices uh, like more of physical activity and controlling weight, avoiding other risk factors. So with this, uh, I end my presentation and uh, over to the chair per persons. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kakar, for a very nice presentation on uh, the role of FOPL um, and the childhood obesity and how far uh, FOPL uh, has made an impact in increasing, uh, decreasing, uh, you know, the usage of uh, this junk food and uh, how the obesity can be, uh, to a certain extent, be prevented. Uh, so it was a very good presentation. Uh, congratulations to you, Dr. Kakar. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Arun, uh, my co-chair, uh, we can um, uh, ask for the questions from the audience, uh, uh, if uh, any, uh, the members who are present uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Arun, um, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, audience, I think we are a small 
group here, there are total 18 persons. I think 10 would be us and maybe five, six, seven others. So total 18 people are attending to it. And we can ask from the audience, audience but my core concern is that the organizers have taken a very good initiative to actually have uh, uh, very eminent speakers on board who have shared their thoughts. And my suggestion is that this should not be end of the activity. That it should not be like that, that we have done one activity and then this is over. Actually, it should be beginning of something big you want to do. And for me, the carry home messages from uh, all the speakers are that we know the burden is high. I mean, we can keep on showing the data again and again. Burden is high, we know it. The next important point is why burden is high and what can we do about it? And for that, our speakers have shown us some insights that burden is high because that uh, we are undernourished population, 40% or so, and we are at greater risk. And some scientific reason given is that this entire game is of that one gram of beta cell mass. And if we are undernourished, malnourished, born, that one gram, if, even if it is less than by 0.1 or 0.2 gram, it makes a lot of difference. And then if, if we are exposed to high levels of sugar and everything because of our social, cultural, all these factors, then this uh, 0.8 gram of uh, beta cell is not able to cope. And we develop insulin resistance or whatever. We uh, gain uh, our waist circumference and obesity, etc. We move on that path. So after this uh, uh, webinar is over, you should constitute a core committee and to look into that what interventions can be put in place. And then you can increase your team. Even we can join you and other institutes can also join you. Our president is also there, I think uh, must be listening in the background, that if this can be taken as a project under the umbrella of IAPSM and some interventions can be planned, that how can we make this 1000 days, foolproof days, healthy days, and that the uh, very wonderful concept of transgenerational karma how can we use all that to actually have some interventions, community-based interventions in place and demonstrate a change? So my wish is that, no question, my wish is that uh, start from here, and maybe two years down the line, if we can demonstrate a change in some community, in some schools, in some, some fashion, we can have a multi-center study and uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, very well said. And uh, I think uh, you have highlighted uh, the important points which were, uh, you know, given by the speakers. Uh, last time when we had one uh, uh, webinar where Dr. Sunila Madam had spoken of, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, FOPL implementation in places where it is very difficult to be implemented, like all the vendors who are using, you know, uh, all these junk foods which uh, all these children are using, how to measure that trans fat, sugar and other things. So there are certain gaps which we need to fill up uh, besides taking care of, you know, the shopkeepers and the packeted foods and other things. Uh, we have also to incorporate that part also so that we can make a comprehensive recommendations um, uh, in relation to uh, the packaging system, how to uh, present it to uh, the people so that we can uh, prevent obesity on a larger scale for the community. Uh, so we congratulate um, and my co-chair also, we, uh, both of us, along with the organizers, we congratulate all the speakers, very well spoken of, 
and um, dr somya who carried this uh, uh, whole thing in a very nice way so thanks a lot and thank you dr arun Th thank you dr kakkar and uh, dr pradeep dr bhola nice to see you and it was really nice having uh, all of us together on this platform thanks a lot and like sir said we should continue further mm -hmm. we should integrate ourselves and uh, you know uh, maybe taking up some multi centric studies and uh, you know further taking up this issue to all the various communities of uh, the country so at this stage i will like to take half minute more uh, actually 10 days ago i am also diagnosed as pre diabetic so now my life has changed i want to share that now this is my song of life <laughs> so i yeah. suggest that i mean this audience should download this song and listen to the song this is the ncd song it focuses not <laughs> on physical health absolutely absolutely on mental health everything absolutely. Absolutely. so now this is the song of my life chalte very rao, rightly said very rightly rao, abhi bhi ye jo aapka chal raha tha to mujhe laga badi der ho gayi baithte hue maine 40000 ki ghadi khareedi hai ye mujhe keh rahi thi utho 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 badi der ho gayi baithte hue to fir main uth gaya to chal chalne lag gaya <laughs> तो भाई दस हजार कदम तो करने हैं करने हैं तो करने हैं तो ये इम्पोर्टेंट चीजें हैं लाइफ में रेवोल्यूशन लाने की जरूरत है तभी बात बनेगी नहीं तो नहीं बनेगी और हम सब डंडे के पी रहे हैं डंडा पड़ेगा तो चलेंगे अब आप प्री डायबिटिक हो गए तो सारी बातें मान रहे हैं तो नॉलेज की कोई कमी नहीं थी स्किल्स की कोई कमी नहीं थी टाइम वही टाइम है जिसमें से हम निकाल रहे हैं लेकिन पहले नहीं करते थे अब करते हैं So, rightly <laughs> said, Professor Arun. Very rightly said. You know, I'm just listening very nicely to both of you. You know, uh, Dr. Surekha is also here, and Dr. Arun, and so. Namaste, ma'am. Namaste, namaste. How are you? In my heart, you know, pura chal raha tha. Jab aap baat kar rahe the, maine kaha there is a. Of course, that will come in our panel also. But it is so important to focus on this issue. Because there is a parallel industry which is going on in our country. Yes, yes. We'll come to that when we discuss the. But Dr. Arun, it is very important that you know whenever we have a problem, we become immediately attentive to that. You know, and all of us are like that. It's not that because you know somewhere along the line we feel that you know, in my family, my brother had you know ischemia. After that, his whole lifestyle changed. You know, because you see that is where I feel that it is. Uh, these are the triggers for us, but somewhere we feel that we have to be, since now it is a competency-based curriculum, we have to focus right from the beginning now and translate into action. So I feel that it is important that uh, we have to focus on these issues so that whole of our, we, there's no doubt about it that we are, there's an obesogenic environment across. So thank you so much. But as the panel comes in, it's pleasure seeing all of you. Thank you so much. Same here, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Surekha Kishore, ma'am, and uh, Professor Arun Agarwal, sir, uh, for your kind words and encouragements and uh, valuable suggestions. We would like to move now to the panel discussion, uh, which would be <clears throat> moderated by uh, Dr. Bolanath. Uh, Dr. Madhur, yeah. uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Bolanath, who is presently working here as our additional professor, he has a teaching experience of more than 14 years. He was instrumental in uh, establishing the population-based cancer registry in our district, Batinda. He is the editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Forensic Medicine and Community Medicine and the Journal of Preventive Medicine and Holistic Health. He has many peer-reviewed uh, public, uh, publications in national and international journals. And also he has delivered several guest lectures on infectious, non-infectious uh, diseases, research methodology, and also in biostatistics and handling statistical softwares. Over to you, Dr. Bolana, sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Soumya. So uh, moving ahead of this uh, webinar, we are going to start our panel discussion and we are having four panelists. Dr. Madhu, Dr. Rachita is going to join or not? No, sir. She she has some urgent commitments, sir. So she couldn't join, sir. Okay. So uh, we are at present having three panelists. 
and uh, first of all, panelist is Professor Sunila Gag, ma'am, uh, a well-known personality in the field of community medicine, public health. So, uh, ma'am is uh, ma'am has worked as a. webinar में फंसा हुआ हूँ यार मैं. Sir, आपके वगैरह सुनने. बाद में add कर लेना ना मेरे को. नहीं कर ले यार. Can you please mute the? So. Professor Sunila Garma, she is a director professor and uh, ex head of Department of Community Medicine at uh, Maulana Azad Medical College. Ma'am has received so many awards. There are just few awards which are mentioned here. Har Charan Orator Award in IAPSM KN. Thank you, Dr. Bola. We can stop here. So currently, I'll be talking. Ma'am, you are a well-known personality. No, I no, think. no. It's okay. We'll carry. Do not require any kind of introduction, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Madhu, please, Professor Harivansh Chopra, sir, who is also. You can uh, skip. You can skip. You can skip. Uh, I think. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so and our good. third panelist is uh, Professor Umesh Kapil, sir. Again, sir is a very known uh, personality in the field of nutrition as well as public health. Sir is at present working in the Department of uh, Epidemiology as a director. टाइम बचा लो यार हाँ सर टाइम बचा लो अपना आगे चलो ठीक है सर सो मूविंग आगे चलो सिंस द बिगनिंग ऑफ द वेबनार वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ द चाइल्डहुड ओबेस्टी एंड एस वी नो दैट टुडे इज वर्ल्ड ओबेस्टी डे एंड uh we ऑल नो दैट इन द बिगनिंग ऑफ द वेबनार वी हैव बीन टोल्ड दैट वी आर facing from the phase of uh, nutritional transition where uh, we have shifted from having the foods which are rich in vegetable fruits etc to that of the foods which are rich in sugar as well as uh, uh, juices and uh, the contents which are high in sugar so therefore i would like to ma'am first of all uh, inquire from you professor sunila gad ma'am ki as we know that uh, yes definitely there is a double burden of uh, disease in terms of obesity is existing so uh, whether you agree with the statement or not if so how much ma'am the uh, very nice question professor bolanath what i would like to say is that that probably you know as you know the data is very obvious and nfhs data is also already out so there is a dual burden kind of and comprehensive national nutrition data is also in front of us so as you know we go ahead we know that we on one hand we are having you know the burden of nutrition stunting malnutrition you see as has been obvious and as nfhs data is also amply highlighted and to this regard iapsm has also carried out a survey through mivcn also but i will also say that you know also the states are facing the burden of obesity also now you know when you talk to the pediatricians or you talk to you know the uh, obstetrician gynecologists my uh, colleague dr harivansh is also here who is a pediatrician you see we are seeing gradually the children who are coming you know they are suffering from obesity and also it is not related to our own observations but our you know different surveys when we talk of comprehensive national nutrition survey or we are talking of nfhs 5 data this has been highlighted amply that you know we are in the transition phase and you know it is not related it's not only a urban phenomena but it is also related to the rural part because you see overall the whole scenario of rural area has changed the percolation of the fast food is also there but somewhere we forget that you know apart from this what i say is that it is not only the kind of fast food which is you know we are talking of the sophisticated fast foods which are there in form of you know through the packets and all that but there is a parallel kind of a food industry which just sells you know the uh, chips and all that you know during rat navratras and all that this is a common observation but without any this thing that what is there inside so somewhere you know there are no healthy food options but at this point i would like to say only that that there is a dual burden of disease we are in transition phase and we have to be alert to this situation thank you 
Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, further addressing to the same problem, ma'am, since we know that uh, NCD is a multifactorial, uh, which is called by so many other factors, and then same is true for the obesity as well. So, ma'am, I would also like to know your views on the current obesogenic environment. You have rightly pointed out that, yes, this problem is not only restricted to the urban, but it is slowly and slowly, gradually percolating towards the rural area. So what kind of obesogenic environment we are going to produce which could harm later on to our children? See, primarily, if you we listen to all the speakers very, very carefully, right from, you know, NIN to, you know, uh, also we listen to Dr. Sairam, we listen to Dr. Kalra, we listen to, you know, uh, Dr. Joel, and then finally, Dr. Kakra, all of them, you know, they really pointed out that it's a kind of a life cycle approach. If you look at our pregnant mothers, you see somewhere when they go for antenatal checkups and all that, there's a usual phenomena that nobody counsels them that they have, it's only a certain amount of weight which is gained optimally in the pregnancy and beyond that it becomes overweight. But you see, none of the obstetricians, gynecologists or our medical officers or our family members also. Mm -hmm. Family members will just say that, okay, you see, now you have to eat for two. Nobody says, and whatever it is, they, it, is it starts from that point of time. The moment, you know, she delivers a baby and you can look at, you know, we are focusing though now, you know, under the program that exclusive breastfeeding should be there and all that. But you see, the, there was a first story which was beautifully pointed out by, I think, uh, Dr. Sairam that, you know, about the two girls, you know, one was a working mother, another was a non-working mother. So you see, there are a lot of challenges of working mothers that they are not effectively breastfeeding their babies. And that's where, you know, when the time of complementary feeding starts, it's not appropriate knowledge of complementary feeding also and how to make a complementary food. And you see, as the child grows, you see that he is about one year, two year and all that, our whole concept revolves around, you know, high caloric foods, you know, kind of it's give, you know, uh, not the balance side, but we talk of give paratha to the child, put more oil, put more, you know, that is there. But somewhere, you know, as the child further grows, you know, he's going to school and all that. So you see the Tiffin concept has also changed. Earlier, you remember our Tiffin concept was revolving around, you know, the, the chapati type, sabji type and all the, over a dal or some, and even our midday school also focus on these issues. But now the Tiffin is what? That give 10 rupees, 20 rupees, buy a packet. Of, the child also sees that, okay, let me eat some samosa, which is giving you 400 calories or, you know, um, if the child is grown up more than it is chola batura again, which is giving you plus 400 calories or, you know, one even pakoda will give you, you know, about 75 calories. But these are something, you know, which we can uh, which we can easily manage at the school canteen level. But something like when we talk about the tobacco control, we say that there should be no shop who should be selling, you know, these foods within the 100 meters. So ha nobody has ever seen the child buy chips and all that from within the school canteen or across. So that is, and then without any information, no teacher even talks about that, that there are that many calories and all that in these packets and you don't have enough information about the calories, sugar, trans fat, salt. So this is another important factor. So let's see, you know, in the school, because of shrinking school size, the physical activity has decreased. And we say something like within home settings also, we call it as particularly it's an urban phenomena, we call it as a couch potato syndrome. Bacha, but you know, couch pe bete bete potato jessa ho gaya karke, he's only watching TV and all that. And it, it suits parents also, those who are working. It's not only during pandemic. Pandemic has only brought the situation to the highlight, you know. And also you will see that during pandemic time, what we observed was also that you see, it's not that, you know, the families never had the healthier choices. They had the healthier choices, but they thought that let us make the best of, uh, you know, easily available food without any information that how much calories they're carrying and to save their time also. And secondly, the food which was produced was also highly caloric. It is not a kind of plate what we talk about. And then again, physical activity being much, much reduced, that is important. Then all of us gradually realize we are also victims of this non-communicable diseases, which are you know there over a period of time. Then you see when you step towards the, as Dr. Arun was pointing out that, you know, you see when we are all aging, you know, because of our limited physical activity, no yoga, no meditation, no, you see, and our diet being very rich in calories, we have to see that basic whole factor is diet. 
and it was amply pointed out that Indians and we as South Asians are also prone for central obesity. So you see nobody, you know, there, there are no regular checkups. So it's not in our lifestyle to go for regular check, checkups. So that's where somewhere, you know, the awareness does not translate into action. And then again, you see when one steps into a older age, again, the person keeps sitting, you know, and it is accepted phenomena that there's a lady, she's aging. Nobody will say that you go out for a walk and all that. Say, no, it doesn't matter. It becomes, you know, it's okay. You're gone older. You're supposed to sit at home. So I think the whole life cycle, if you will look at, somewhere there has to be a thrust on behavior change. And also, you know, on our food habits, food styles, and when we talk about front of package labeling and all that, what an individual is eating is usually <coughs> very good and which, where you see which contains not much information and you see there is no labeling and even you see different initiatives whatever have been taking you know at the policy level and all they have not translated into action whether we talk of at the level of fssa or we talk at the you know level of who or we talk at the ministry level because we have to remember that we are fighting against big giants. So that is where we have to be very, very careful about imparting not only correct information about our lifestyles, but also correct information about, you know, the foods which are available. Thank you so much. Rightly pointed out, ma'am. I totally agree with your thoughts, ma'am. In fact, uh, parents are also promoting by offering 10, 20 rupees to, the, uh, to their kids. And they are just stating that to go to the canteen and purchase a packet of chips or anything else and have it. So we are, in fact, creating bad kind of environment. We are creating the obesogenic environment for our kids, which might have a bigger impact in later part of life. So um, uh, my next question is to Dr. Omesh Kapil, sir. Sir, since uh, you are already working on the NF, NAFLD and uh, we have also organized the webinar on the same and uh, the NFLD has also been introduced as a part of the non-communicable disease program in our country. So, sir, I would like to uh, know whether is there any association between the NAFLD and the obesity and in your opinion, how will childhood obesity can impact on NAFLD in later part of life or in upcoming years, sir? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bola. Uh, grateful to you. Uh, actually, if you look at the about uh, 50 to 60 percent of the childhood obesity becomes adolescent obesity, and adolescent obesity gets into the adult obesity. That's number one. Number two is NAFLD is strongly associated with uh, obesity and overweight. And uh, if you look at the different parts of the world, we don't have much data from the country, but if you have to look at the different parts of the world, we are having an increase in the prevalence of obesity and the increase in prevalence of NAFLD. They are going hand in hand. So basically, if you look at, yes, both are strongly associated. From our country, we do not have data on uh, NAFLD amongst the children, and we don't have data particularly, whatever data which we have is 50 to 60 percent of the obese and overweight children, they have fatty liver disease. This is a three, three studies have been conducted in the country. That's all. We don't have much data from the country. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, so, sir, that could be a research topic for uh, one of our PGs here? Oh, definitely, yes, it can be done. Only issue is that uh, to diagnose NAFLD is a difficult issue because the most common method which is available is ultrasound and ultrasound does not pick up 30% um, of the NAFLD cases, mild and moderate that don't pick up. So we don't have those type of facilities available. So that's a, of course, that's an area. In fact, the AIMS uh, daily have conducted studies in, on NAFLD in Balabgarh area, but they've used the ultrasound, but it doesn't go well in any international scientifically peer-reviewed journal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, since you are working in the uh, nutrition area for a long period of time, so, uh, sir, I would also like to know, 
I mean, what message you would like to give to the participants uh, regarding the control of community in the control of obesity in the community? I mean, with the reference to the nutrition, how, what practical aspects we can take in order to control the childhood obesity in terms of nutrition, sir? Actually, if you look at uh, obesity doesn't run in the families or doesn't run, <laughs> it runs in the families, but families don't run. <laughs> so that's an important issue. It, genetic has very little role to play in the current scenario. And uh, most important message is that high income group and the middle income group, they should try to minimize their uh, food intake, okay? And they should increase their physical activity. Low income group, there's no message for them because they are already quite a good number of them suffer from chronic energy deficiency. But yes, the high income group particularly, they, the newly rich people, they consume the food which is tasty and the food becomes tasty when you add more oil and fats to it. Okay. And uh, this is something very important. So they should take less food, do more physical activity. In well-to-do group, Nobody is going to die of hunger. Okay. They would die of otherwise overnutrition. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would also like to invite uh, the participants as well as uh, others who have joined this webinar. If they are having any queries to the panelists, they can, they can just put uh, their question in the chat box or they can directly inquire as well. So if there are no more questions, then I would like to move to uh, Dr. Harivansh, sir. Sir, we know that you are a very renowned public health specialist, sir. Also, I know personally that you are also working as a pediatrician. So, sir, uh, you will be the best person, I feel so, that uh, in giving the answer on effective interventions, which could be uh, used for reducing the childhood obesity, sir. So in your opinion, sir, what all could be the interventions which could be taken for reduction of the childhood obesity? Uh, thank you, Dr. Bolanath, for it. And thank you, Dr. Vakar, for inviting me to this particular session. And uh, as you said that, yes, I have been working in the uh, field of pediatrics for a, now more than three decades or something like that. And my main area of work is in pre preventive pediatrics. And uh, because uh, you asked the first question from uh, our president that uh, there is a double burden and that double burden is there, definitely there. And uh, uh, my main uh, domain was prevention. And when I say prevention, uh, uh, prevention of malnutrition, on which I have worked for more than three decades and have developed a model, uh, which I, you might be aware of. We call it a big win model. So you have to understand uh, that, that the same model uh, can be applied, can be applied to prevent, for the prevention of obesity. Because if you talk of the interventions, basically, because as we know that uh, obesity is multifactorial, front of FOPL is one aspect only. And it starts from the antenatal period, you see. And you'll have to understand that FOD was the hypothesis which was given a long time, three decades back in Finland by the Ashworth. And they, they recommended that fetal origin of adult uh, diseases. Then they, they came out with the second uh, important factor. And that factor was uh, uh, weight at one year of age. That was the most important factor. And that gave, gave rise to our big win strategy which includes six, seven interventions like exclusive breastfeeding, immunization, then growth monitoring, which is again, very, very important. I think growth monitoring is one parameter which is very important because if the growth is optimal, then there is hardly any chance of child going either into malnutrition or into overnutrition. So that is the one area, of course, WHO has recommended that every child must be monitored at least once a month in, in the first year of life, but nowhere it is happening and we are not able to do it. 
and that that uh, before let, let me first first try to finish the intervention and then we will uh, maybe talking about how to do it so that was that was another aspect and then uh, w was for complementary feeding and then again that complementary feeding is again very very important fopl is not only important from the point of view of grown up children fopl is also important that what we are using what we are giving in our complementary feed all homemade food are to be advocated because you are going to develop the taste bud of the child also it is not only because whatsoever artificial uh, formula uh, complementary feeds are available they are very tasty because they are more having more sugar so so every child would like to eat so you have to shift to that and then the, the next next intervention was i i is for your iron supplementation across the board from from antenatal to the childhood and then the, there was n n is again what is n n is very important and when we talk of w i you can add lot of things uh, uh, say hand washing you can add safe water you can add so that these are important aspects then when we are talking of n so lot of things can be done in the end say no teenage pregnancy then no child uh, say the minimum gap should be there for 3 years between the two pregnancies then you have to give extra nutrition in pregnancy and lactation and more important than that is you have to do a monitoring of the weight in the antenatal period itself like dr kalra was talking about the weight gain is different for for a normally nourished mother there is a different formula for the weight gain for overweight mother mother there is a different formula for and these weight gains are differentials and that is again very very important now the point is this we have the interventions we have the models how to do it who is going to do it that is the point so point is this that when we talk of a country like india and that is why i defer i i say we should have a 635 days approach in spite of 1000 day approach because we 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 have to understand the number of beneficiaries which runs in crores in our country if if we are having 2.5 crore pregnant women that means we are having approximately 2.5 crore infants also and these are to be taken care of by whom and nutrition is a neglected subject remember health does not take care of nutrition nutrition majority of time is being provided by the anganwadi centers in the form of supplementary nutrition and there too they are failing to reach to under 3 they are majority of time concentrating on over 3 we 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 try to find out the impact of supplementary nutrition on on under nutrition we 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 hardly find we could find only two studies where they have studied the impact so that is important so similarly because again obesity same origins starting from the antenatal period same interventions if the mother is going to gain the optimum gain then there the child is going to be born with the optimal birth weight you monitor the child for one year he is optimum is gaining optimum gain and there is a need to carry out large number of studies maybe multi centric studies between the 1 to 5 years of age we are not talking about that particular age because as a preventive medicine specialist we must promote prevention you see if the child is not going to gain excess weight during the first 5 year of life the chances are that there will be no obesity in 5 to 9 years of age and if there is no obesity in 5 to 9 years of age then probably there will be less obesity in the adult stage group so these are the various uh, the, the the cycle approach the crux by which we can apply how we have to apply i think that maybe we can take up later on so that is my take as far as the various interventions are concerned sir even uh, we can take it right now because na since you have talked about the intervention bit about the intervention ki how we can take sir do you think already we are running a national health program on the non communicable disease so do you think there is a need to start a separate program for on the obesity by government of india where yeah. we can inculcate all the policies or uh, i mean some kind yeah. of interventions at the school level etc okay okay thank you thank you for asking this particular question as as you know and i think uh, for the benefit of the participants they will be aware that health is a state subject so first and foremost we need to have a centrally sponsored program that is point number 1 the point number 2 is because we are having a double burden so what we need to have as far as my thinking is concerned or my vision is concerned and my area of work for last more than 35 years is concerned i think we need to have a comprehensive child health care program 
which will not only will be able to take care of the undernutrition but also of overnutrition which will not only be able to take care of the childhood illnesses which will not only be able to take care of the neonatal illnesses which will not only be able to take care of the faltering immunization which will not only be able to take care of the growth monitoring problems and everything so if we have a comprehensive child health care program and we develop a package but you see it's a very small package and i'm working on it and uh, by the grace of god if if i am i am on my timeline probably i am going to start a master class series on that how to manage common pediatric problems at primary health care level so that is what i am what i am right, right now working on and probably we'll be starting that package this will be very very useful to all the interns as well as for the post graduates of our specialty because ultimately we have to have that kind of thing now coming back to program i i also say that we need to revisit the definition of primary health care you see we have a very good infrastructure as far as the rural area is concerned but unfortunately the focus on urban area is lacking so puscs are still being established it will take time but all said and done you see we are stick still stuck up with the accessibility affordability and acceptability we have to have an, another a that is accountability because ultimately the the anm is catering to a 5000 population and she should be responsible and accountable for that 5000 population right so she can do all these interventions she can prevent she can do it so accountability at every level not at the anm level but at the anganwadi level at anm level at primary health care center level at doctors level at mic level at at specialist level everywhere the accountability has to be there if you have to provide the quality care so these are the things i think which are important and my take again will be that in spite of starting a program on a specific disease if we have a comprehensive child health care program which includes all the things in one package and it should be a centrally sponsored program only then we will be able to make a dent as far as the double burden is concerned as far as the childhood obesity is concerned thank you very much and dr bhulanath i like to add one more comment also that you see we have a huge program on non communicable diseases you see yes. where if you look at the you see the basic origin of when we talk of hypertension when we talk of diabetes when you talk of cardiovascular diseases when you talk of stroke when you talk see the root cause is obesity somewhere we cannot have you see i have got the experience of developing national programs we know that actually you cannot have program upon program after all there is x number of people you know who are managing these programs and in real sense i will say that you know when we talk of the healthcare functionaries they are looking after many more activities than what are enlisted also there so somewhere we need to look at you know that program upon program is not going to help us it is important that whatever are there we need to strengthen that and the interventions within those programs they need to be strengthened so that is my immediate take to this when subsequently we'll come to other questions thank you so much yeah ma'am uh, i would also like to ask uh, the question which is uh, inquired by one of our past participant since we have also met in the uh, fopl workshop which was held at uh, ams rishikesh Uh, participant has asked me what major areas in place to address issues of junk foods so basically first of all you have to start right from the you see who are the beneficiaries whom are we addressing to so we have to talk about this issue to all the stakeholders primarily we have to talk you know at the right from the beginning as i said who are our stakeholders most important stakeholder is our community to whom we should sensitize them number one thing that these junk foods are not good number one but then you know there are different set of stakeholders at different levels when we talk at school level there are teachers when we talk at policy program level there are people then there are whole set of you know i'll say that associations you see when we talk of only preventive medicine association it's not the only association when we talk of obsgyny association pediatric association so you see as i said that i am a part of also organized medicine guild you see that's a combination of so many professional association so we have to talk horizontally together in the same language 
along with the policy makers and program managers, along with the industry. You see, ultimately it is the industry which is responsible. And we already had a dialogue, as I was telling, we started the dialogue in 2011, you see, along with WHO ministry and, you know, the industrial people were called, you know, but somewhere, you know, it is very difficult to deal with the corporate sector. They will hide in some way or the other. You have to be very smart and consistent in your approach. So everybody is an important stakeholder, but whose stake is more important? It is mine and your stake. We are actually the ones, you know, who are basically affected by this whole issue. If I create, I have an awareness, I will sensitize my child. In return, he will sensitize his peers. Then also, you know, the whole sense of information comes from, you know, the teachers and all that, and our frontline workers who are going to the community, our uh, ashas or Anganwadi workers, they are looking after different programs and they're also doing house visits also. So somewhere when we are talking of dual burden, you see they spend five to 10 minutes within a house or, and they spend a little more time, you know, when there's a pregnant mother or so. So right from that time, she has to start talking. If there's a child, she sees during a visit that, okay, this child is obese. It is not that, nahi, koi baat nahi bacha hai. That thing should not happen. It is there one should immediately point out that we see that this child is putting on weight. What is the, you know, so this should be the entry point of our dialogue. And as you know, has been pointed out also, regular monitoring of growth and development should become our very integral part when we come to, you know, our association's role. I'll be talking about that point. But then it is very important that we must focus at all the stakeholders and most important stakeholder is the community itself. And we are as professional associations, we are stakeholders as policy and program managers. But again, you see industry is the most important stakeholder and a difficult stakeholder, which is challenging. But then again, you know, we have restarted with the dialogues from 2017, 18 with FSSA and all that along. So that is where we need to be very focused and pointed in having our dialogue with them. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Umesh, sir. In fact, uh, it's a uh, speaking is good, but this does not changes the behavior of the person. Most important, yes. We keep on talking about it. We don't. Most of us, we don't know, including including the professionals. What is junk food? What is definition? That's true. And we just keep on talking about junk food, bura hai, junk food, bura hai, so bilkul nahi khana chahiye. But the bottom line is, once in a while, I also consume junk food. Okay. But what is important is, I have seen a very methodological, met uh, meticulous program in Oman, where you have a growth chart up to five years. As soon as a child goes into the school, there is a BMI monitoring chart. And that continues, that each, cha each child chart continues. That's the BMI chart. And they maintain the BMI of each child. But in spite of that, they have 60% obesity, right? So what is more important is we have to emphasize that they have to increase the physical activity. We have written to Abhitabh Bachchan, we have written to Virat Kohli, we have written to so many so-called public figures that what you are doing is wrong. Right? But then there's always a catch in it. The way they, they get the money, they, they say we are not doing this. So they make a line <clears throat> for it. National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. They have conducted a large scale trial on Horlicks. And for about for two years, this came in the TV media that you consume this Horlicks and this has been shown that it provides much better bone health, much better growth and so on and so forth. So what we are talking about, I think so we, uh, it's a very difficult situation we are in. And what Dr. Srinagar was mentioning is absolutely right. But the bottom line is, whenever I see a beggar who is overweight and obese, I feel that I'll never give him a tip. You know, 
there's no point in having the overweight and obesity and i tell you one thing it's so difficult to curb the desire to eat something this is very very strong absolutely very very strong absolutely right sir and i agree with you dr kapil it is very difficult to have a dialogue but somewhere you know we have been able to make a difference also like if you will see you know in our own lifetime it has happened that all the food industries whether it was nestle or everything they would come and sponsor the workshop how this baby friendly initiative came in it was because of you know initiative of so many people you know that is where it translated into action now you know our organizers are scared of even calling these people because of the fear of you know kind of you know being uh, you know punished and all that so i think things happen but in a country like us we have to be really innovative persistent and all that that's why i said that you see it, there are two sets of where there are families which are you know we have we have shrinking families now and as you were telling that once in a while it is difficult but for some of us it is a way of life if, like if i look at it in my offices there are no families back at home there are young people who have come in search of jobs so what is option available to them there are many but you see they'll go for you know pakoras they will go for you know and it's a routine phenomenon and you will say that since the time you came to delhi i can i can quote the example that you know this is how it is so i think you know our change has to be or our advice because somewhere we say that you know we are hesitant also to talk about but i have also seen consistently i think uh, dr harivansh is here that if you will look at the pediatricians you know who are practicing and look at you know because i have got the experience from the home setting also they maintain very good road to health cards they will point out to the mothers that this is where is the pointer of course you know urban affluence is always there but you see the problem is the that, that is where i see it as a challenge that in rural areas when we talk of the children you know consuming you know it's something fancy and they say that okay give us 10 rupees we will eat our tiffin ultimately they will buy the chips or they will buy a packet without any this is because it is you know good to their taste bud so somewhere i feel that that is also where our teachers or school authorities or you know important stakeholders need to see something like what we have done in tobacco as i am telling that smokeless tobacco teachers are talking but they are consuming this is what my you know the recent researcher has shown you know that he was my pg student so similarly we need to give in more and more topics of research to our md students and phd students also to focus on this area thank you so much thank you very nice observation thank you thank you sir. Yeah, can I come in, Dr. Bhulanath? Yes, yes, sir. I was in fact uh, just uh, mentioning you in the next for the next question. Since sir, you and ma'am both are associated with the IAPSM since long time, and you are also holding the uh, some position. So, sir, I would like to know apart from the government effort, uh, whether IAPSM is also doing some some work in the direction of this uh, decreasing the burden of NCD or obesity, sir. uh let me first respond to the observations which have been made by my co panelist as far as uh, the monitoring in the oman example is given um, uh, dr bolana it is important to understand when we are talking of prevention prevention is cheaper but is far far difficult to practice that that one has to understand and for for preventing anything you have to have a comprehensive approach number 1 number 2 you have to have a very intensive and focused approach you can't you can't leave it that okay let's let let let's first have the problem and then we try to solve the problem so it is not similarly when we when when, when we talk of undernutrition i have seen even the biggest pediatrician failing to treat a severely malnourished child and similarly i have seen even endocrinologist failing to treat a obese individual why because treatment is something which is very very difficult and as a preventive medicine specialist we must understand that we have to apply prevention and if we have to apply prevention you must understand you have to count every child every mother and as dr kapil was saying that you have to have those chart not only chart you have to provide them education also the moment they falter whether they falter below or they falter above you have to provide them the education you have to provide them the education so that when next monitoring is done then that faltering is corrected you must understand this so and i think 
probably this is the uh, the the point which I wanted to highlight again and again, and I will be doing that because you see, if you are dealing with these kind of situations day and night, then you know that it is possible. But then again, two words you will have to remember: you have to be very very focused, and your effort has to be very very intensive. It is not a one-time activity that you have monitored the weight once in a month and then you forget about it. No, you have to give the advice at that particular point of time. And for this, a lot of sensitization is needed. So as far as IPSM is concerned, I think the madam will be the right person to take it up first and then I'll be responding. Bob. Over to you, madam. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bhulanath, being a part of this fraternity, is <coughs> already aware of the fact that, you know, for teaching of the undergraduates and postgraduates also. One is the practical implementation of training through, you know, basically giving them the families where, you know, the students, you know, right from the undergraduate level, they are told about, you know, how to do the dietary assessment and all that. And plus, you know, what are the cultural practices or family practices. So they are supposed to do the comprehensive dietary assessment also. And they're supposed to fill the growth charts, you know, basically with regard to under fives and all that. But, you know, uh, I will say that over a period of time with the uh, uh, revised, though it's a competency-based curriculum, and now we are again focusing on those issues with the MCA guidelines coming into families being followed for five years, because this is the difference which I see between my time and, uh, you know, these times when I followed the family for five years, you could see that there is an under five child whom you can follow it over a period of time, whether it's undernourished, at that point of time, it was undernourishment, which was more common. Now we are seeing this. So it is very important to look at that perspective. And also we have to sensitize them. You know, though all the lectures are there in form of non-communicable disease program and all that. And most important is that, that we have to have the competencies to monitor, you know, the obesity to road to health card, which are, you see, there but they have to be discussed threadbare at a UG level also. So somewhere I see that, you know, when we cover the subject only till seventh semester, the time is only finite and there is no horizontal integration between, you know, the department of pediatrics or department of, uh, you know, obstetrics and gynecology. The curriculum talks about, I just, before I came, I spoke to, you know, Sri Ramchandra Institute of Medical Sciences, how this take up an under five child, you know, right from the first year. And over a period of time, they cover different issues, whether that is related to undernutrition, overnutrition and all that. And the best example, they said, we start with non-communicable diseases, but different medical colleges are diff at different point of time. So somewhere, you know, these competencies have to translate into action. And even when we talk of non-communicable diseases also, we have to practically demonstrate them and make them understand what is the root cause. They will, that is when they will be able to do the comprehensive assessment as well. So, you know, as a, post, uh, uh, as a part of, you, I'll see uh, the, uh, when we talk about, you know, preventive and social medicine or community medicine or IAPSM, our strength is our undergraduates and postgraduates. But, yeah, you know, through uh, being in community medicine, we are also, you know, influencing the policies and programs. So that is where we need to influence our training in the form of a competency-based training, which is there in quite a number of medical colleges because each medical college is at a different level. So that's where we have to, number one, focus on strengthening our both UG and PG training, which is our attempt and which is being done. Wherever you see it's being done, it's being done. But India is a big country with 608 medical colleges across. There's a big divide between the public and private sector. If I will look at CMC Valor, Every family is mapped therein. Every child is mapped therein. So that is where, you know, we see the digital mapping and we see, you know, completely, every family's complete information is there. But then on one hand, we have another medical college. So there are a lot of differences. So I feel that, you know, competencies to monitor, you know, whether we talk of obesities and non-communicable diseases are there, but they need to be implemented. But we are in a best position when we look at our, you know, UG level is a sensitization point, but we need to reinforce through PGs and PhDs at that level. We have to give, you know, a lot of attention to this area and which is being, you see, already it has come as part of competencies and is being implemented because now we are talking of competency-based curriculum. Sorry, Dr. Mesh, you were raising your hand, but in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Sorry. 
it's a it's a very yeah. simple i would just like to share that <clears throat> obese ka matlab ye nahi ki wo mota hai wohi garbad hai theek hai there might be some post graduate students for the information you may have a normal weight person but metabolically healthy and metabolically unhealthy you may have underweight person or underweight child he may be metabolically healthy metabolically unhealthy and similarly obese person they may be metabolically healthy and non healthy so we must remember that what we had done in 2002 we screened about 18000 children in delhi and we found that the in the low income group who are mcd uh, students 2.5% were metabolically unhealthy so i think so for the benefit of the postgraduate students i thought i must share this point that we have to look into all these factors and to ensure that we are able to deal the situation scientifically sab sade mote kharab nahi hote theek hai aur sade mote acche bhi nahi hote and uh, we must remember that all diseases are quite common among the obese children also and anemia is one of them the although they eat a lot but because of the chronic inflammation and hepcidin they do suffer from anemia anyway that's a, part, a different thing over to you ma'am thank you very much yeah so uh, dr bolana can i come in now uh, very rightly doctor i never wanted to discuss that because that's an entirely set different set of metabolic obesity and what are the guidelines as far as the pediatric age group is concerned and what are the guidelines when somebody has got a cardiac uh, case in the family that what kind of time you are going to screen the child so these guidelines are different of course it is the american academy of pediatrics which has given the guidelines now coming back to your original question which you asked about the iapsm part so dr bolanath i i i firmly believe that each medical college is having its own urban as well as rural health training center and i i agree with madam there are different sets there that there, there is a heterogeneity there are colleges with very good facilities there are colleges with medium facilities and there are colleges with no facilities now it is up to the college to decide but then can we can we can we as an association give promote an idea that in, in our own area can we can we have the our area say urban area you are you must be catering to a population of 10 10000 to 20000 can you have that population screen totally educated totally so that there is no case of undernourished child there is no anemic child there is no obese child we ask others to we ask others to do it you must understand that that is the difficulty that is the difficulty and that is why i was saying accountability part you have to do it until and unless one of us or few of us have the zeal have the passion to demonstrate that yes it can be prevented if not in totality maybe you can reduce it to the 50% of the national average and then what model have you used what kind of workers have you used what kind of interventions you have used document it and then probably scale it up and i think that will be the biggest gain as far as the iapsm is concerned so these these are the challenging situations but then when the challenging situations are there the actions have to be more concentrated focused and directed so that is what i want to say so so this is up to the uh, various colleges to decide whether uh, they are ready to take it up they can take one area one intervention multiple area multiple interventions depending upon the availability of the resources yeah, and can demonstrate and can demonstrate and then can act as a model centers i can share my my story of my center where the district uh, health officials came and they said that your center is a model center and we want to use it as a model urban health center and we want to demonstrate 
and we want to collaborate with you we want to do so many activities which you are doing for our population so we are ready to even give you the workers the infrastructure and other things also so it is up to the up to the colleges to decide and to take action and if you are able to document it then it will be better and then probably we can have a policy that yes the both under nutrition and over nutrition can be tackled with defined set of interventions yeah Thanks. so definitely your idea is very right dr uh, harivansh that we have to be very comprehensive but we have to see that we do not deal with finite number of problems we do have you know overall set of problems so there is a family based approach there is a chc based or uh, community health center based approach or rhtc or pa uh, rural health training center approach we have to see within the framework how many competencies can be achieved and this is one of the most important competencies because that is the foundation of a family that means we focus right from antenatal period and you know right quality antenatal care now the stress is not only antenatal care we are talking of quality antenatal care and where most of our students should know that there has been modification in the quality, uh, what is the routine antenatal care and quality antenatal care going to the institutional delivery following the child you know as per the national program guidelines even you know if, if we do that it is not possible to do every month but even if we follow national guidelines which is being done that will make a lot of difference but nonetheless since this current topic is focusing on front of package labeling at no point we should lose the opportunity of addressing this issue you know whenever the mother comes we should talk about the balanced diet healthy diet again make a mention of this readily available food stuffs and all that then you know when we are dealing with under five clinics also school health program is also within our domain so we should talk about these issues at every level so that is important to look at because we are dealing with this topic again we said we are multidisciplinary we are holistic and we have to make sure that you know on one hand we talk about maternal mortality infant mortality neonatal mortality so we have lot of issues but coming to this issue our foundation has to be raised right from the beginning and when, then again our competencies are there which are well defined and if we do implement those competencies it is going to make lot of difference and quite it i'll say that all the competencies you know which are related to maternal and child health are dealing with this issue because nutrition is also a big forte within us which talks about healthy and balanced diet thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, so with this uh, we would like to conclude our this session of uh, panel discussion and i would like to thank all our panelists for sharing their thoughts and facts ideas I hope that uh, we will be in near future will be able to control the childhood obesity not at the large scale but at least uh, with small small efforts at small scales we can uh, then come up at the large scale as well so with this i would like to now invite dr ankita who is assistant professor in our department at ams patinda for the vote of thanks can can anybody everybody can uh, put on the uh, video so that we can have a click we we have taken we will still take yes okay you have taken that is good i just wanted to take one ani rashi so, number sorry share yeah. for this yeah 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 okay i am just give me a minute okay so, fine thank you dr prati yeah please yeah, go ahead please, please go closing address from your side i have just skipped no, that, that, that's fine sir that's fine please, please. no issues we respect the time of everybody have some uh, go ahead dr can just give him for 2 minutes and then we go ahead <laughs> yes 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 i think so dr pradeep please so bob all the stalwarts are over here and they have already given the best uh, regarding the front of package labeling uh, and the childhood obesity it is a well established fact aims rishikesh is uh, currently running up a project multi centric along with the iapsm ma'am is taking up the lead recently we had a national uh, consultation and deliberation under dr umesh kapil sir at nams so we all are working together for the same common goal by addressing the word obesity obesity among the childhood and fopl is just one of the part 
of addressing the issue. So with that, I just uh, hand over the mic to Dr. Ankita for proposing the vote of thanks. Dr. Ankita. Uh, thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of organizing team, we would like to thank Honorable Director Ames Batinda, Professor Dr. D. K. Singh, who has always inspired us in organizing academic discussions on important public health issues such as uh, obesity. We would like to thank our chairpersons, Professor Dr. Sureka Kishore, Director Ames Gorakhpur, and Professor Dr. Arun Agrawal, Head of the Department, School of Public Health, PGI Chandigarh, for pertinent discussions on devising practical solutions to prevent obesity. Next, we would like to thank our eminent speakers, Dr. Sai Ram, NIN Hyderabad, Dr. Sanjay Kalra, Bharti Hospital, Dr. Joel, Trinanad and Tobago, and Professor Dr. Rakesh Kakkar, Ames Patinda, for their insightful presentations focusing on adopting the life cycle approach to prevent obesity and discussing nutritional transition, transgenerational karma and pregnancy, five ways to prevent obesity in 1000 days of childhood, and roll off front of package labels. Next, we would like to thank our esteemed panelists, Professor Dr. Sunila Gurg. Malana Azad Medical College, Professor Dr. Umesh Kapil, Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences, and Professor Dr. Harivan Chopra, LLRM Merit, for their deliberations on obsogenic environment, long-term impact of childhood obesity, and effective interventions to, to address these. Next, we would like to thank all the distinguished faculty members and colleagues who have spared their valuable time to attend this webinar. So let us all be an advocate in respective areas for prevention of this global epidemic and pandemic of childhood obesity. Thank you, one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rakesh, very nice. After uh, Mangal Giri's this thing, now this is the second time. It's so very good. That after coming, the initiative has been started immediately. That's Thank why you. we want you to join and uh, we want to listen you. So you. it was not with a PPT, but we have you have expressed your thoughts in a very 